All right, I think we should get started. We've given the five minutes, the statutory five minutes for anybody stuck in traffic. Uh, there's some seats up here in business class. If any of you are interested, feel free to move forward. Um, good morning and welcome to the latest in our long-standing Blogs and Bullets series. I'm Sheldon Himmelfarb and I'm the President and CEO of the Peace Tech Lab here at USIP. And it is really great to see so many old friends as well as so many new faces in the room. So it's been five years since we launched uh, the Blogs and Bullets initiative. Um, and I am really pleased to say that in that time, it has generated quite a following, as you can see here. Um, but also, it's been recognized by organizations, the Neiman Foundation at Harvard, as being essential reading on the role of new media and social change. It's also been referenced often by governments, international agencies, and new media experts alike. So why has, as I should also add, it's also probably one of the most downloaded um, publications off the USIP website where you can find the full series. So why has this series been so well received? Um, certainly one reason has to be on the demand side of the equation. People are looking for answers. Um, for the first time in my career, I don't have to convince anybody of the role of tech and social media in conflict and social change. The Arab Spring did that, put it right on the front pages, and ISIL continues to um, push that issue to the forefront. It's spawned a whole cottage industry of researchers that are looking at these new tools, all trying to answer some very, very important questions like this one. How can we use social media to tip the balance in favor of activists, nonviolent change agents, and social entrepreneurs who are trying to make a positive impact on their communities? That's the kind of question we wrestle with all the time in this building. How can we amplify the power of these tools for good above the power of the same tools for harm and hatred? Unfortunately, but perhaps unsurprisingly, much of the discourse around questions like this has been anecdotal, it's been hyperbolic, and it comes from convenient labels like this protest is the Twitter revolution, or the jihadists have hijacked Facebook. Very convenient for the headlines, but it really misses the, the important substance behind these, um, these changes. And that really brings me to the real significance of the blogs and bullets work, which is on the supply side of the equation. The, equation. the research team has consistently supplied data-driven, fact-based answers to these incredibly complex questions about the relationship between social media and conflict. So on this five-year anniversary of the series, I really would like to begin the day with a special shout out to the members of this research team whose consistently rigorous methods and uncompromising commitment to the highest standards of research really, I have to say, have been an inspiration to me personally and I know to many others. Mark Lynch, Shauna Day, and uh, from George Washington University have been the driving forces behind the series from the beginning and they were quickly joined in their efforts by Dean Freeland from American University. And from the Peace Tech Lab side, we've had Anand Varghese as our mainstay. So Mark, Sean, and Dean, thank you for your work. And Anand, thank you for your work, past and present. Please join me in celebrating their conference. And folks, if, if you're here today, I can promise you that you will find the previous studies by this team on the role of social media in the Arab Spring, on the analysis of social media in the Syrian conflict. I promise you will find these studies, which are both on the USIP website and you can pick up copies of some of them out there. Um, you'll find them not only enlightening, but a really good read. Now, I'm excited to turn the stage over to them as they introduce you uh, to the findings of their latest study. Appropriately, they've pushed the envelope even further than previous reports, looking at time after the international news crews have moved on, after the crowds have gone home, and after the dust has settled. Focusing on Egypt 
they look at how the same social media that can help unite people in times of great political change can also serve to sow the seeds of division and fear. And they do it, of course, with the same rigor of the past work, this time analyzing, among other data sets, a sample of 62 million tweets. Seriously. They looked at 62 million tweets. Can you imagine? I can't imagine anything more painful than that, frankly. <laughs> but they've done it. Um, I don't want to give the whole game away, but two, uh, a couple of quick housekeeping things before I turn the podium over to them. First, turn those cell phones on stun mode. Second, I've got some not so good news that Chris Moody, the vice president of Twitter, who we were going to close the day with, has been called away with a late-breaking emergency. So unfortunately, um, we don't expect to have my interview with Chris to close the day out today, and we're really, really sorry about that. If there's any good news, it means we're going to get you out of here a little bit earlier, so you'll get a bit of your day back. So with that, please join me in welcoming up here to the podium um, Mark Lynch, Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at GW, who will get us started on the program. We ready, Anna? All right, so thank you all for coming out. And um, I want to echo some of the things that Sheldon said. This has been an amazing five-year-long project. And to me, at least, it's been an absolute model for a collective uh, public scholarship. Uh, so we have, we've had this research team, which has evolved over the years. I would also like to, uh, to point out uh, Henry Farrell and John Sides, who are co-authors of the first study and a series of workshops that we did in collaboration with Larry Diamond at Stanford University, bringing together a really amazing group of scientists, data scientists from the industry, scholars, activists from the region. And none of these actually produced any direct uh, uh, reports or writing, but they profoundly informed the way we thought about data, about analysis, and about how to try and combine the two in the service of engaging with really deep and profound and important, I believe, uh, public issues, uh, such as the war in Syria, uh, the, uh, the uprising in Iran in 2009, the Arab Spring, and now the question about social media and transitions to democracy. And so we actually conceived this report as one of trying to go and look at different periods in the sequences in which social media might matter. One of the first finding, one of the first arguments that we made way back when was that it never made any sense to talk about the internet causing things, that this was far too broad, far too vague, and that the only way you could really understand how social media mattered in politics was by breaking it down into far more specific kinds of mechanisms, institutional arenas, and, and issues. And as with many people, I think there's been a convergence of research focus on, uh, among the research community on this. We tend to see the role of social media more in terms of amplifying, accelerating, intensifying trends that are caused elsewhere. In other words, it's not a Facebook revolution, it's not a Twitter revolution, but there's a revolution. Twitter and Facebook are involved, and we try and figure out exactly when, where, how, why. And so in some of the earlier reports, we were looking at moments, for example, of mobilization and activism under fairly stable autocratic regimes. And there we tended to highlight things like the role of social media in providing an alternative public sphere, uh, allowing activists to find each other, to connect across distance, whether ideological or physical, to introduce new ideas, new voices into the public sphere, challenge red lines. But really, this was a story about relatively small numbers of people finding a voice under relatively settled and stable institutions. Profoundly important. Uh oh. Maybe not that important. <laughs> OK. Um, profoundly important, but very, very different from the way it mattered when we moved into, for example, Syria, where we were looking at a failed state, a transnational civil war, one in which social media was being used actively by the combatants uh, in order to mobilize support, to intimidate and frighten uh, their adversaries, to, to, uh, to try and solicit funds, and to try and uh, attract foreign fighters. In other words, this was a story when we moved into Syria. It was a story of insurgency and war in which social media was intensifying, amplifying, accelerating the kinds of strategies that insurgent groups would use under those conditions. Now, 
for this one, what, I, what we wanted to look at was the, a general story about the role of social media in a very distinctive type of institutional environment, uh, a transitional environment where you have the possibility of a transition to democracy, uh, but it's not yet institutionalized and consolidated. Every political scientist in the room knows that this is one of the most difficult times. All transitions. Um, are uh, are characterized, I and mean, what makes them transitions is that they're characterized by uncertainty, profound uncertainty. You go back to the transitions literature, O'Donnell and Schmitter, the foundational literature on transitions, it's all about uncertainty. It's about not knowing um, not just who's going to win, but what are the rules of the game? What is going to determine who is going to win? So if you look at some of the, the foundational works of uh, political theory about democracy, a lot of it is about you know the rotation of power Power and you know you participate in democracy because you lose this time, but you know you'll get another bite at the apple. You can compete next time and have a chance of ruling. The institutions are settled. You know what the balance of power is between institutions. You know um, about the, the about the laws that govern political competition. You know what you what you know basically what the future is going to look like and what and how you should compete. But transitions aren't like that, especially transitions like the ones we saw in the Arab Spring, but I think it's a much more general problem. What we saw in the Arab Spring cases again and again was transitions that unfolded where you had political competition, but you hadn't yet actually written constitutions. You didn't know what the rules of the game were going to be. You didn't know if it was going to be a parliamentary or presidential system. You didn't know what the powers of the branches were going to be. And at a really fundamental level, you didn't even know the identity of the country you were going to live in. You, and so there were a lot of symbolic battles in Egypt that I'll be talking about. Is this an Islamic country or is it an Arab country? Is it a democracy or is it a presidential regime? These are, you know, these are huge fundamental existential questions which are radically uncertain. And that's okay. That's what transitions are for. You're moving from one system to a new system. But the intuition here is that Social media's unique and distinctive characteristics of acceleration, of intensification, um, and, and especially something that all of our reports have focused on, the way that social media tends to, uh, to drive homophilia, self-selection into ide ideologically closed communities of the like-minded, these are all things that tend to play on the worst parts of transitional moments. In other words, you always have uncertainty. Every transition in the history of transitions has had uncertainty. But now we're in an age of socially mediated uncertainty, which tends to intensify fear, intensify the speed and the, and the intensity by which people share rumors, share violent imagery, and then reinforce their own in-group uh, you know, convictions, prejudices, and fears while driving distance away from the other side. It becomes really, if you've ever been on Twitter, you know, if you're like a Red Sox fan or something or a Packers fan or whatever, you know what this is like in, in low stakes affairs. But in high stakes affairs, it's even worse, where it becomes extraordinarily easy to be surrounded by communities of the like minded who egg you on, who flatter your prejudices, who tell you what you want to hear. You hear the same story repeated it again and again and again and again, and you come to believe that it's true. Meanwhile, other people in the same, uh, in your same country, they're hearing the exact opposite rumors, seeing the same imagery, constructing their own narratives. And so what we were, what we were seeing and what the kind of the intuition we went in with was that social media would have uniquely destructive effects on transitions for exactly the same reasons that it had relatively positive effects uh, during mobilizational moments and under relatively stable and settled institutions, whether autocratic or democratic. Transitions are the worst possible time to have social media, but every transition from here to when, I don't know, when Google takes over the world is going to be socially mediated. This is what transitions are going to look like in the future. And so we need, as people who are trying to build uh, technologies and trying to build policies to bring about successful democratic transitions, we have to understand and correct for these biases um, and, and these mechanisms. So. 
how do we how did we go about how do we want to go about doing that? Um, we decided. Oh yeah, so we focus on these specific mechanisms. I just mentioned them: uncertainty, uh, the clustering phenomenon, fear, which is linked to the the uneven distribution of fear. I'll come back to that in some detail when I get to the findings of the report. And then this last point, um, which is something which was huge on our Syria report: the bridging, uh, the role of the English language. There's a very distinct English language cluster I'll describe that basically translates the politics on the ground to the outside world, and it does so in highly idiosyncratic, predictable, and in many ways destructive ways. But I'll get to that in a minute. So we decided to look at Egypt, and we decided to look at Egypt. Um, I put that slide in the wrong place, eh, whatever. Okay, so we decided to look at Egypt as the paradigmatic case of first the Arab Spring and then of the utter failure of the Arab Spring. Um, what we wanted to do was to look at, not just because it was uh, something that got a lot of publicity, but because Egypt is at the center of both the Arab Spring narrative, at the center of Arab politics, and it's a paradigmatic case for political science and for anyone trying to understand the possibilities of democratic transitions in this new socially mediated environment. Now, there's a number of phases here that we could have looked at, and I'm going to explain why we why we did what we did. The, there's been an enormous amount of research on the Tahrir uprising itself, those glorious 18 days where you saw, you know, the millions of people in the streets, uh, Mubarak forced from power, and these genuinely unprecedented ideological coalitions um, coming together around a single common goal of of uh, the people want to, the people want the overthrow of the regime. We all remember that. It's been extremely well studied. We've done earlier events on that, and I think that um we have a pretty good understanding of how that worked at this point. I would note that much of what we learned from Egypt, and I think Josh is going to talk about this later, because uh, he has a great article, the Carnegie Reporter, I think, that, that really brought a lot of this out, that the, these kind of modal forms of this, where, to me, when I see the kind of almost a flash mob coming together of different groups, different ideologies, different social groups coming together around a single, easy, shared goal, overthrowing the president. I mean, not easy, but a single, discrete goal. To me, that's no that you see the same things happening, whether it's in Ferguson, uh, Missouri, or or Baltimore, or in Ukraine, or Turkey, or you know, or in Egypt. Very similar types of dynamics. But we felt that that had already been studied. It ends, as we know, on July 3rd with a military coup, um, which then introduces a very different type of politics, a violent, nasty uh, a military dictatorship in which there's severe repression. This is also worthy of study, but we wanted to focus on that middle period. And specifically, we decided to focus. So what we have, um, and as I mentioned in a minute, is data from the entire middle period, from February 11, 2011, until June 30th, 2012. And we analyze all of it, but we give special attention to the period after June 30th, because basically we mark the uh, presidential election, which brings uh, Mohamed al-Morsi to power um, in, uh, at, at the, uh, as the end of the first stage, where the supposedly successful transition. Military rule ends, a civilian president uh, takes power, and we track in great granular detail, I hope, the, um, yes, um, um, the, uh, the year-long process by which you go from a relative period of unity to the complete polarization and failure of governance, which leads to the uprisings of June 30th, 2013, or 2013, and the military coup, which follows. Okay, so how do we study it? First, I want to really emphasize this, because this is a theme that's going to come up repeatedly. It's run through a lot of our work, and um, I, I think you're going to hear it from uh, the other speakers as well. Even though our data is coming from a series of, of social media platforms that I'll describe in a moment, um, we do not believe that social media alone causes anything. Social media is part of an information ecosystem, and it's a very tightly integrated media ecosystem. Anybody who follows any of these cases, not just Egypt, but anywhere, will be intimately familiar with this. So Al Jazeera will, will uh, you know, a television station will broadcast a program, and they will use video video footage, which they found on Facebook, which was published on YouTube, and they found on Facebook. This 
figure here simply shows you the, the, the proportion of all retweets in our Twitter data set, which I'll describe in a moment, which come directly from mass media accounts. This is like at Al Jazeera. This is at Al Masri Al Yom. This is at uh, uh, Dar al Sharuk, right? These are simply mass media accounts. And this radically understates it, right? This is not including people who comment on an article from a newspaper. This is not people who are engaging in a conversation about a, a broadcast on, uh, on you know, uh, CBC or on TV. This is simply direct, man, direct automatic retweets of media accounts. And as you'll see, um, collectively, you're looking at about 19 to 20 percent of all retweets come from mass media accounts. And one of the things that's interesting about Egypt compared to our previous report on Syria is that Egypt has a rambunctious, lively, and extremely, I think, a, a interesting domestic public sphere of its own. And so if, if those of you, you know, kind of the old timers out there who remember our Syria, Syria report, one of the points we made was that almost all of the coverage was coming from trans from regional and international media sources. But in Egypt, you can see that it's primarily Egyptian media that is being retweeted. And that's actually very interesting. And it gets to my point about everything we're talking about unfolding on Twitter and on Facebook is happening within a broad media ecosystem, which is tightly integrated and has clear feedback effects throughout. Okay. So failed transitions, everything's terrible. Okay. So, Anand, can you... Um so just to give a sense of, of the mechanisms I'm talking about, the, the spread of fear and everything like that, I just want to show you two, very briefly, two video clips. This is completely ordinary things that we were seeing. So this is December 2012. This is on TV, which um, was at one time kind of an activist television station associated with revolution, which became uh, associated with the anti-Morsi movement. This is what on TV viewers are seeing is happening out in a protest outside of the presidential palace. Look at these horrible people peace attacking peaceful protesters, ripping apart tents. Look at that horrible, un it's almost an unhuman mob, right? Okay, next one. If you're, if you're more in like the, uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood camp, here's what you think of those peaceful democratic protesters. Um, this is from the Rost News Network, again, associated with the revolution at first, and then inclines quickly towards the Muslim Brotherhood. They're not peaceful activists. Look what they're doing to, to buses which were used to transport Muslim Brotherhood um, people. They're burning them, they're trashing them. Again, how can you reason with people like this, right? Okay, that, that's enough. The reason I put these up here is just to give you a sense of the kinds of things that are being routinely shared and, um, and, and discussed and consumed, but extraordinarily disproportionately within specific clusters. So what I mean by that is if you're kind of a generally a Muslim Brotherhood supporter, you probably never saw that first clip. And if you did, you saw it as propaganda, as kind of, oh, God, incitement and dishonest lies. And if you retweeted it, it was probably to complain about it. Same thing with the other side. If you're an anti-Muslim Brotherhood activist by March of 2013, you see that clip not at all or as propaganda and something to be dismissed and um and uh, you know, and all that other stuff. So you're living in two different worlds in terms of what you think is going on, and what you think is going on is violent, chaotic, dangerous, and potentially, as we move along, exterminationist. As you get into the extremes of language, which begin to dominate Twitter, as we'll see uh, in 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 the later periods. Okay. So I've been talking a lot about context. Let's go to the data because I'm not going to talk forever. Um, the data, we have two data sets that we're drawing on, um, and because this has always been a hallmark of the Blogs and Bullets project, we want to go and not just like say opinion things. We want to actually look at what people were actually saying. And I'm going to say that for those of you who've been following Egypt for a long time, you're not going to be hugely surprised by the, the, the bottom line findings. It became polarized. It became violent. People didn't like each other. We know that, right? But what we hopefully can show with the way we slice this data and analyze it using a variety of methods is to be able to get at a much more granular, granular level how different sectors of society were communicating with each other, how it changed over time, and um, what kinds of content was flowing through these uneven networks. So the Twitter data set, 
was built around um, every uh, every public tweet, including the word Egypt, either in um, Arabic or English, um, which, as Sheldon said, is about 62 million tweets, about 7 million unique users. Um, and this is... Um, uh, this is something which uh, I assume Alex will have something to say about later, and maybe Josh, um, which is it's a conscious methodological choice to build a data set this way. There are other ways to build a Twitter data set. For example, many people use hashtags, and uh, and they start with, you know, down with Mubarak, and then they collect every tweet which includes the hashtag down with Mubarak. But we felt that that tended to bias the results, right? Because you're only seeing people who say down with Mubarak, and you're missing people who either support Mubarak or couldn't care less about Mubarak. Um, um, other people, and I think this has been a really useful approach that I think, again, we're going to hear about later, is to begin with seed accounts, well-known users, and then you build out from those users and kind of spread out to collect the people with whom they interact. And that's a good approach, um, but it, it, it creates a different type of data set than the one we've got. We thought this was the most um, uh, generic way we could do it, to capture everybody from all ideological um, uh, trends and basically be able to see a slice of the Egyptian public. 62 million sounds like a lot. It is a lot. Um, it killed at least one laptop of mine. Um, and um, my collaborator, uh, Dean Freeland, who will be here shortly, it killed one of his laptops too. But um, it's only a slice of what was going on. I would say that I would guesstimate the total number of tweets here probably in the 250 to 300 million range. Um, and that's just a guess. But um, so we have a slice. It's big slice, and we think it's a representative slice. But it is still only a slice. Um, we then decided to break it down by retweets, which is again, I think, a defensible and I think, in my opinion, a good methodological choice. But it's not the only way that you could break down this kind of data set. You could use um, friend lists. Um, you could use to build networks. You could use um, at replies to capture interaction effects. We can talk about that more later if you want. I th we think this is a good way of getting at what we're trying to get at. We then um, use uh, 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 the Louvain community detection method, which Dean, uh, when he gets here, can tell you about, because he did that part, um, because I speak Arabic and he speaks math. And um, that's why I love his, this research team. Um, but basically what it does is it looks at who's retweeting whom and the intensity and frequency with which they retweet each other, and then is able to detect communities of, of um, of interaction um, in, in the network. We then used a, a fairly innovative uh, combination of qualitative and quantitative methods to track uh, constant communities over time. And I'm happy to go into more detail on this. We have a paper out in the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences, which goes through this methodology in considerable detail. So it's complicated, but, but it works. Uh, we have several robustness checks. It works. And uh, we're actually pretty proud of this. Um, and then we used a content analysis, a lexicon-based content analysis. We came up with a, a set of words um, associated with fear, uncertainty, violence, catastrophe, chaos, fitna, a chauf, um, uh, what else, uh, a fudda, um, a couple of others. And then we basically did uh, a numerical analysis incident count of the number of times that it, that, that it was tweeted. Then we did a second data set on Facebook, because um, Facebook is actually far more widely used than Twitter uh, in Egypt. Uh, roughly, uh, you know, if you want to use like uh, Gallup's, uh, would, Gallup, which probably has the best uh, the, the, the data that we've seen. Uh, in terms of usage, you might have about 15% of Egypt uh, of 15% of Egyptians online are on Twitter, and about 97% of Egyptians online are on Facebook. Um, so we wanted to analyze Facebook, but again, I don't want to uh, spend belabor this too long, so I want to get to the findings, but we see really profound ethical issues involved in studying Facebook data. Anything, for me personally, anything which accesses uh, people's private pages becomes a potential bre breach of privacy and ethics, and we struggle long and hard with how we could study Facebook without violating anybody's privacy. Um, what we came up with was we selected a, a set of seven um, public pages with very, so ever, all of them have at least a million uh, fans or members, and um and so you can see the Ross News Network is, uh, it was initially revolutionary and then became Muslim Brotherhood. Basr al-Yom, Sharuk News, um, those are kind of mainstream centrist newspapers. Uh, We're al-Khalid Said and the April 6th movement are, um, you know, kind of activist, uh, secular, sec, you know, secular-ish activist movements. On TV is a revolutionary TV station, which became anti-Islamist. Ikhwan Online is the official um, uh, site of the Muslim Brotherhood. And then what we did is we, um, 
Yes, that's, and then we were able to collect all the posts that had been made, but then what we did is we took a random sample of those posts and then collected all of the comments that were posted to it. So in other words, the posting, that's like the official communication strategy of an organization or of a newspaper. That's interesting, but we were more interested in how people were engaging with it, so we looked at the comments, and we ended up with um, uh, about 600,000 comments, and then we did uh, a series of tests uh, looking for cross-commenting and cross-posting to get a sense of trends in interaction. The intuition here being we're looking for people who in the early days would post comments on both Muslim Brotherhood and activist sites, and then when did they stop doing that? And that's the measure of polarization we were looking for. Okay. So, with this analysis, we then uh, found a series of persistent clusters. Um, okay. Persistent clusters, this is coming from Twitter. So, the political public is always the biggest one, um, and that's the core group of political commentators, activists, newspapers, media outlets. Most of Egyptian mass media would end up here, but not all, and there's interesting variations along the way. Then there's a series of activist clusters which um, appear and disappear over time. There's three big ones that appear at different moments. You can see some of the anchors, Berdai, um, Agla Lamar, Abel Al Fadl, Ahmed Fouad Negam, a couple of others, just um, Muslim Brotherhood figures were generally represented here in these clusters until roughly October 2012, and that's actually very interesting. Um, and that's actually one of our key kind of findings in terms of these clusters. Up until the polarization sets in, that's where you would find them. People like Assam Erian, um, uh, Monim Press, um, uh, various other people I could mention. Now, Morsi didn't tweet much. I mean, he was on Twitter, but he wasn't that. He wasn't a Twitter star until later. Um, then there's the Muslim Brotherhood cluster. It only appears in September 2012, and then is persistent throughout. Um, and then these two, which I think are extremely important. The couch party is what we call it. Um, Zogby, in his 2013 survey, called it the um, the what the pissed off public or something like that. But basically, these are people who are mostly non-political. At first, I wanted to ignore this cluster. I was deeply annoyed by this cluster, because it was all like Google Earth pics and bad jokes and football and, um, you know, pop videos. And I wanted to ignore it, because I'm a, poli I'm a political scientist. I want to do politics. But it turned out it was one of the largest and um, most persistent clusters, and it became engaged with politics at key moments. This actually, I think, is one of the real things which you can catch by this method that you can't catch uh, with the hashtag approach or the seed approach. Um, uh, Dr. Bassem Yosef, the comedian, was, like with John Stewart in the United States, was one of the key points of entry into politics for these people, and I think it's extremely interesting. And then finally, the English Bridge. Um, I'm in this cluster, unfortunately. Um, but uh, this was a very strong, robust cluster of journalists, activists, English-speaking people who translated Egypt for the rest of the world. This gives you a sense of their relative size, both of the Twitter sphere as a whole and of the relative size. Um, and what you'll see is obviously it gets a lot bigger. But, you know, the couch party kind of grows, the Muslim Brotherhood grows, and crucially, wait, where's the oh here we go. Um, crucially, what happens is Early on, you have lots of activist clusters representing different trends and approaches within Egyptian political life. And then over time, they all fold into a single cluster. This is actually one of the most important things that we find, which is the disappearance of diversity within the same ideological trend. If you go and you look in the period from March 2011 up until um, February of 2012, you have a lot more clusters than you do what we call super clusters. Um, what that means is you have three different activist groups all arguing with each other but internally coherent. By the time you get to the end of the transition, that's disappeared. If you're anti-Islamist, you're in one cluster, and it is a coherent, largely insular cluster. Same thing with the Muslim Brothers, same thing with the couch. Okay? We, so we also found regional clusters that are really interesting, but I'm not going to talk about much here. There's one that's clustered around Al Jazeera personalities. That was really important in our Syria data also. There's a UAE cluster, which did not appear in the Syria data at all. And this is interesting. And what's also interesting is Ahmed Shafiq, the, uh, the guy who lost to Morsi in the presidential election, is one of the leading figures in the UAE cluster throughout. Very interesting. Gulf Islamists, there's always Gulf Islamist clusters. They love Twitter. Uh, and then there's 
there's a resistance axis of kind of uh, uh, pro-Iran, pro-Bashar, uh, Syria-focused people who sometimes talk about Egypt. Let's say just a word about this English bridge. One of the things we do that I'll describe more later is we can actually see what kind of content is being shared in each cluster. And what you see here is that this English bridge, and again, uh, just to be, uh, if, if any of uh, my uh, English uh, cluster friends are out there on the webcast, this is not about individuals. I'm sure your Twitter feed was great. I know mine was wonderful. Um, <laughs> but on the aggregate, over these 62 million tweets, the um, members of this English bridge cluster tended to share between 5 and 10 percent of their content originated with the, with the activists, with the political public and the activists. And less than 1 percent was, was shared from either the Muslim Brotherhood or the Couch Party. In other words, we interpret this to mean that um, if you were reading the English language Twitter sphere, you were getting an extremely skewed view of what was happening inside of Egypt, which tended to reflect the point of view of activists and to very much downplay the, uh, the perspective of both the Muslim Brotherhood and of this Couch Party. I think that helps to explain why so many in the United States were taken by surprise by June 30th and the size of the June 30th protests and um, helps to explain other things as well. Okay, I gotta go faster, so we're gonna look at uh, the measures of polarization, and this is like the heart of the study, but it's also stuff which I think will be fairly intuitive. Um, I mentioned the, the disappearance of diversity within clusters, very important, and a very clear trend. This is insularity. This is basically how many how many uh, retweets within a cluster originate from within your own cluster. And I think the trend line is pretty clear. It goes up. Uh, you go more insular over time. They don't all become more insular constantly, but you know if you draw a smoothing line, you'll see it. I should have done that. Uh, cluster churn is the movement of individual accounts from one cluster to another in time period. So basically what we do is we calculate a Jacquard coefficient for the number of accounts that are the same from one group to the next group. And what you're seeing then is how many people stay and how many people move. That's what I call it churn. Um, and so the interesting thing here is that most of them become, you know, there's less, and as the numbers go up, that means there's less churn. The Jacquard coefficient is higher. Uh, more people are staying in the same cluster. I would just highlight two things here. The first is that even at the peak uh, 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 non-churn, the highest Jacquard coefficients, never more than 0.5. In other words, there's movement. This, these are never absolutely homogenous, never move from one cluster to another, even at the peak. The other is that, I, I forgot to change the, uh, the labels, but X is, the, um, is the, the couch party. Look at how their cluster churn plummets right around the time leading up to, to the June 30th protests. And that also is associated with the content that we'll be seeing later. But it's very important because basically what you're seeing is a relatively insular cluster suddenly opening to new entrants, becoming bigger, more politically engaged. And you start seeing people who you recognize from other clusters, superstars, appearing in this one. Proximity is a measure of how much content is shared between different clusters. So I already mentioned the, uh, the English bridge and how unrepresentative it was. The highest one that you get from anywhere is the Muslim Brotherhood retweeting tweets from the activists, 7.3% uh, over the full period. Nobody else is over, I think, five for the entire, uh, the entire period. But basically, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's low, but uh, that would have been a really messy slide. What are they saying to each other? I, I love this. I mean, most of what we do is in Arabic, but I thought you could read this one, just to get a sense of Egyptian Twitter is just like the Twitter you know and love. <laughs> Mohammed Baradai, violence is escalating, security forces inept regime failing, and then Islam Abdurrahman, a pretty well-known Muslim Brotherhood spokesman on Twitter, was like, burning, torturing, dragging innocents, protests, cover for thugs, crimes, blood on your hands. So, yeah, that's what, you know, by the time you get to um, March 2013, that's what passes for dialogue. So, it, this is important, though. Engagement and interaction never goes away, but the tone and tenor of that engagement changes dramatically. Um, very briefly, if we switch over to the Facebook and the cross-commenting, we see some, some fairly similar things. This is, I know that's a really messy slide, we're, we're, we're working on it. Um, but basically, what we wanted to do was to get a sense of the trends in cross-commenting that I described before, and you can kind of see the trend there. What's interesting about Facebook and is that you see the peaks are the opposite of what you see on Twitter. In other words, on Twitter, when things get tough, people seem to retreat into their communities. On Facebook, they seem to go into the comment section and yell at each other. 
And that's actually interesting, and it's very important. Um, we're not quite sure what to make of it. I'll, I'll have some conclusions at the end, and hopefully Alex can say something about it. But, um, but this is actually a kind of interesting finding. In terms of insularity, this is the percent of empty cells, not a single shared comment. And as you can see, the Muslim brothers are the most, um, uh, are the most, uh, like more than half of them have no shared comments at all. But on TV, the anti-Islamist TV station is almost as insular is almost as isolated, not just from the Brotherhood, but from everybody else. And then if you go and you look at the main activist ones, uh, uh, April 6th, Khaled Saeed, uh, Rast, and the, and the mainstream media, there's not a lot of cells where you have a fortnight where there's not some degree of cross-commenting. That's what I mean by saying that interaction never goes away completely. Uh, and, and, and you see this on Facebook and on Twitter. Just for an example, this is the Khaled Saeed page who are they interacting with the most? Well, you, not surprised, they're, they're interacting most with the April 6th youth movement, they're both activists. But they're also interacting with Ross News, which is a Muslim Brotherhood affiliated online uh, network. Ikhwan Online, they don't like anybody. But look who they interact with the most <laughs> on TV. Believe me, those weren't happy conversations. <laughs> so. This slide is a little bit confusing. Don't dwell on it, but let me just, um, and I can explain it more if you want. But basically what we did is we did a reverse of the Twitter insularity along with the Facebook cross commenting and aggregate to kind of show where it's similar and where it isn't. And you'll see most of the time it's similar. Facebook seems to have a little bit of a lag compared to Twitter, which kind of fits with what we know about Twitter as being a breaking news, immediate kind of thing, and Facebook having a bit more staying power. But um, you can also see some points where there's peaking on Facebook and um, declining on Twitter. And uh, I think the early period, uh, period three there, is actually a very interesting one that I can talk about if you want. Okay, then we looked at content. What are they saying? Um, and these are some, I translated a few of the sample tweets. Uh, you see, worst anarchy in the history of Egypt, civil strife we feared, violence, counterviolence, we will not turn Egypt into the anarchy, blank screen, um, very scary. Um, yeah, may God protect Egypt, all these things. Um, but we were, we were looking at both the incidence of words and the context. So this is where the qualitative coding comes in, along with the quantitative. So for example, in the early period, in kind of uh, July, August of 2012, almost all of the uh, the comments that included those fear terms were saying things like, we have broken the barrier of fear. We will never allow people to divide us. We will overcome this fitna. We will, you know, and so it was very interesting, um, not just what is being said and when. This is, so this is like the, the, the kind of the money slide. There's a lot more I could have done, but I wanted to keep it relatively uh, clean. Uh, this is just the activists, which includes the political public and the activists in a super cluster, and the Muslim brothers. And this is the, uh, the incidence of fear. Don't worry about the y-axis. I can explain it if you want. Just look at the trend lines. Basically what you see is that, and this, I think this is really important, they peak at different times and at different levels of intensity. Now this is uh, total by cluster. This is normalized by the number of users in the, weighted by the number of users in the cluster. Because what I didn't want, so with this, you can get an artificial spike because there's just a lot more Muslim Brotherhood users than there are another cluster. So you say, okay, yeah, they said the word chaos a lot more, but that's because there's more of them saying it. This one is weighted uh, by the number of users. So what you see is they spike at different times, and, and I think the most important ones, the most important ones are the one right around the time of the constitutional crisis, um, which was when Morsi was trying to force through his constitutional reforms, and you have the violence at Ittihadiyya outside the presidential palace. The Muslim Brotherhood, you'll notice that the, um, the activists spike earlier, but the Muslim Brothers go through the roof which is odd because they're the ones who are accused of attacking the secular activists. So the violence is at the hands of the brothers, but the fear is also being most manifested in the brotherhood cluster. Whereas the activists, their fear spikes before Ittihadiyya and then plummet very quickly afterwards, which is very interesting. Then they both spike at the same time in, um, in late January, but then look what happens when they start talking about presidentially or parliamentary elections in March, when suddenly the activist fear spikes, goes through the roof, whereas the brothers can't really be bothered by anything. They think everything is just, is just lovely. That gap in perceptions is extremely important. 
But I want to note here that this is the period from that second video clip that I showed you, when you have the activists attacking Muslim Brotherhood party offices, burning their buses. There's a lot of violence at this moment, mostly directed by activists towards brothers. And yet, look where the fear is spiking. The fear is spiking with the activists, not with the brothers. Again, really interesting to me. Now, the last thing I just want to point out here with this slide is look at the couch party. <laughs> they don't care at all, right? They're not scared. So the, the, the highly politicized clusters, the activists and the Muslim brothers, they're doing that thing that I was describing before. The couch party almost never seems scared. And that's also, I think, a really interesting and important finding. And it reflects kind of what I, I remember. My first exposure to this, I think some of you have heard this story before, was in November of 2011, uh, right on the brink of the, um, the, the parliamentary elections in Egypt. And according to Twitter, Cairo was in flames. I was there at the time. Cairo was burning to the ground in November 2011. But two blocks away from Tahrir, everything was absolutely normal. Mohammed Mahmoud and Tahrir, they were in flames. It was a horrible, anarchic, violent mess. But every place else was dead calm. And so those findings actually, I think, reflect that quite nicely. The activists fighting their wars in Tahrir Square, they're afraid, they're violent, they're agitated. The rest of Egypt, not so much. OK. And this uh, then kind of, we, we, we compared this to survey research. And I think we kind of find some similar things. But I've been talking a long time. So let me just jump to the key findings. Um, we, we, so we think that um, we do see uh, considerable support for the argument that um, social media is having these effects in transitional environments, but it's not as clean and neat as we might have expected it to be. The clustering is real, um, and, and I think we have empirical evidence that I think really gives us a new way of understanding how the clustering worked and the relationship between those clusters. Um, but it's not as clear cut as I think some of the standard internet does bad things narrative would have. Have. I think that um, it really points to the need to focus on the non-activist population and to not get sucked into either the English Bridge cluster or any of the politicized activist clusters. Not to say that those people aren't important, but they're clearly not telling the whole story. And uh, to have a real sense of what's going on in Egypt, I think you need to uh, expand your 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 um, your aperture and, and see more. And. Um, and yeah, intensifies, accelerates impact. There's some more stuff that I could have shown you about that, but we don't have, really have time, and I can talk about it more if you want. But anyway, so that's that's the Egypt part of the report. This event is designed then to bring in, the next panel is going to come up, uh, people with deep experience on Egypt, who've done their own research on Egypt, and uh, they're going to talk about their own research and about this report. And then uh, we'll take a short coffee break, and then, oh. Great. Uh, we're really delighted to have uh, 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 Michael Posner here, former Assistant Secretary for Democracy and Human Rights, um, who told me he went to Egypt 12 times um, during this period, so has a view of this from the inside and has been a lifelong advocate for human rights and democracy and has seen it from the advocacy side as well. Um, he'll give a, a, a keynote address uh, after the coffee break, and then we'll have a panel of uh, comparative context uh, with Josh Tucker and Adrian Labas talking about Eurasia and Africa. Manal Omar uh, should have been here to talk about Libya, but she got called away, um, so she can't make it. But we'll have some nice comparative extensions uh, after coffee. So thank you, uh, and my panel, um, come on up. So um, Alex uh, Siegel. Uh, Confusing. Yeah. Uh, and then Tart Sahar. Uh, oh, yeah. OK. So. Um, I've asked uh, each of, uh, of, of my colleagues to speak for about eight to 10 minutes, very briefly. Uh, Alex Siegel from New York University, um, Tarek Radwan from the Atlantic Council, Sarah Khamis from University of Maryland, and uh, Alex Hanna from uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and uh, Alex, uh, the floor is yours. You can come on. Thank you. Just waiting for my presentation to come up here. Purple screen of death. Yeah.
Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank USIP and Mark Lynch and the whole Blogs and Bullets research team for having me here today. I'm, I really think that their report represents a novel contribution to the study of online political behavior in this post-Arab Spring transition period. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you a bit of my own research on this topic and hearing from the other panelists as well. So I'm going to start off by giving you a brief summary of some of the findings from a paper I've been working on through the Social Media and Political Participation Lab at NYU called Tweeting Beyond Tehrir, Ideological Diversity and Political Tolerance in Egyptian Twitter Networks. So I'll give you a brief overview of my findings and in particular what they can tell us about the causes and consequences of online polarization in Egypt in this period. So the main question that I seek to answer through this paper is, do Egyptian Twitter users in ideologically diverse networks exhibit greater political tolerance than those in more homogenous networks? And the short answer is that yes, they do. I find a strong, positive, significant relationship between network diversity and tolerance in the Egyptian Twitter sphere. And moreover, the more time that users spend in these networks, the stronger the effects are that we find. And so I'm not going to go into too much detail about my methodology at this point because of the time constraints. But essentially, what I do is I have my own data set uh, comprised of Egypt-related keywords, including the Arabic word for Egypt and the English word for Egypt uh, that Mark brought up in his study, but also including other political terms. And, the, and my sample begins at a later time period. It starts in January of 2014. And through the Social Media and Political Participation Lab, I've now collected about 160 million tweets and the collection keeps uh, growing on and on. But what I did for this particular paper is I took a sample of Egyptian Twitter users that talk about civil liberties online and that I can tell from their metadata are actually located within Egypt. Um, and I used a combination of machine learning and human coding techniques to evaluate the, the extent to which they support uh, extending civil liberties to political outgroups. And so this also in involved estimating their ideology and the ideology of all of the friends in their networks to determine the extent to which they follow Islamist or secular political elites online. And so to give you a sense of what tolerance or intolerance kind of looks like in practice, I have a picture of an example tweet here. And I think even without translating it, you can kind of see it's pretty intolerant. Um, and what the Arabic says over here is, inshallah, the traitors, spies, and terrorists will receive the death penalty that people want the execution of the Muslim Brotherhood. So this is a pro CC guy who clearly is not too much in favor of extending civil liberties to Islamists in this period. I also wanted to briefly highlight the geographic diversity of my sample, because I think this may also apply to the blogs and bullets report as well. When I embarked on this research, I was sort of thinking, OK, I'm probably looking mostly at youth in Cairo. But I was pleased to discover that there actually is a fair amount of diversity. We have people up all sort of over the Nile Delta, over in the Sinai, down the Nile. So we are getting a pretty wide cross-section of Egypt. And while I wouldn't argue that this is a representative or random sample in any way, it does tell us about the attitudes of a pretty wide cross-section of the Egyptian public. Um, and so the other thing I want to talk about is there was a lot of discussion of causality and the issue of the actual role that Twitter is playing in influencing attitudes here. And one of the things that I'm trying to do in a next step in this research project is collect real-time data in changes in networks over time, as well as real-time data in how the content that people tweet changes over time. So we can start to measure the multiple causal pathways between or through which this relationship occurs and try to get a really good sense of the actual role that social media networks themselves might be playing in this process. So one thing that's useful about this individual level data is we can really learn something about how people cultivate their political communication networks online. And so what this figure up on the slide shows you is that friend-follower relationships are highly dynamic. I chose to show a two-week period because this is the amount of time that the Blogs and Bullets report kind of divides its data into. And what we see is while approximately 10% of the sample don't change their networks very often, many people 
people are constantly adding new friends or removing friends, all the way out to 120 changes in just a two-week period, which I think really gets at the dynamic nature of this process. Um, and another thing that I think is important to mention is that offline networks can also influence the diversity of people's Twitter networks and the sources through which they receive political information. So Twitter's algorithms will suggest new users to follow and interesting content based on the phone and email contacts of Twitter users, even if you haven't supplied that information, if any of your friends have, that's all known by Twitter and involved in the process by which new users are suggested for you to follow. I think um, another process through which this happens is if you were to follow Morsi on Twitter, it's probably going to be suggested that then you follow the Freedom and Justice Party or um, other Islamists. So yes, we're sort of, Egyptians are kind of consciously curating these political networks for themselves, but there's also a number of external factors influencing how their networks grow and change over time. So one of the interesting findings from my paper that I wrote is that elite networks, or the networks of politicians, political activists, and political parties that people follow online, tend to be quite hom homogenous, especially compared to the non-elite networks, which might include people's university friends or you know think reasons for the outs from the outside world why people might be choosing to follow particular users online. But when we look at the elites that are followed, we see on the right this box. Uh, represents users that only follow secular elites. So this might be someone who is following, say, um, President Sisi, al Baradai, Amr Hamzawi, and the April 6th movement, but they don't follow any Islamists. And the bar on the other side shows people that follow exclusively Islamists. So we may see people who are following um, Morsi and Khaira Jashtatar and the FJP, but no secularists, for example. And so if we do believe that spending more time in these homogenous networks in these echo chambers actually causes people to become more intolerant over time, this is important to realize the manner in which the cultivation of political communication networks uh, can influence polarization more at the individual level than the aggregate level that's discussed in the blogs and bullets report and looking at changing dynamics and retweet networks over time. I will say, though, I think it's important to recognize that this is not all gloom and doom. Yes, the post-revolution period doesn't look quite as rosy online as uh, what we were seeing in the early days of the revolution. But given the high degree of censorship and gag orders and increasingly limited uh, sort of base of traditional Egyptian media, I think the online sphere is still providing an opportunity for the exchange of information among parties that might not otherwise see or communicate politically with one another. And that's kind of highlighted from the tweets that I've seen through the machine learning and human coding that I've done. A lot of the more tolerant users, these might be people who often appear in this kind of middle section of the figure who follow a more even cross-section of Islamists and secularists. Are often tweeting against censorship, against arrests, um, against state violence, and it's directed both at Islamists and secularists. It's not just your in-group, but the people in general view the kind of uh, restrictive environment in the post-revolution Egyptian state as a problem and want to decry it online. So, you know, yes, polarization is a huge problem and a threat to stability in Egypt today, but social media, in while it sort of intensifies this process, may also provide some reason for optimism as well. Um, so just in the last uh, minute or so that I have, I want to put forth a couple of suggestions for future research kind of based on this project and the blogs and bullets report, and I'd love to hear thoughts from the panelists about this moving forward. So uh, Mark mentioned the challenge of thinking methodologically about what, what social media data are we going to choose to study Egypt in this period, and I think 
retweet networks definitely provide um, very important insight into the broad aggregate level trends of online polarization. And then my more individual data can give you a look at how individual network changes influence political attitudes. And moving forward, it may be useful to employ more combinations of these methods and maybe include mentioning networks or the other kind of advantages that social media data give to us to try to get a broader picture of this phenomenon. And also regarding the work with fear that was done in the blogs and bullets report, I think uh, fear and threat perception is often connected to tolerance or support for exclusionist policies. We see that a lot in the political science literature. And I think it might be interesting to see whether the users in my sample that express intolerance are some of the same people that express fear in the blogs and bullets report. Um, and then finally, I think uh, drawing on event data, it would be interesting to see the degree to which particular events, perhaps episodes of police violence or um, violent protest or terrorist attacks, et cetera, impact online polarization and fear and intolerance, both in the short term and over time. So again, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm looking forward to discussing these issues and the other themes raised in the report and the rest of the panel. No, because they have to mic you. All right. They've got the camera. All right. <laughs> Great job. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for having me today. Thank you, Mark. Um, I feel like I'm uh, kind of the on the user end of the spectrum <laughs> rather than you know the, the admin data. I'm not a social media expert. Uh, my my experience, mostly in Egypt, initially started off on the activist side of things and eventually migrated towards the analyst side. Um, but having you know uh, had my experience in, in human rights and and such. Uh, but uh, a lot of what I'm going to say actually echoes what Mark was talking about. And, and really, I'm going to uh, I'm going to agree with a lot of what I saw in, in, the, in the paper. Um, you know, the, the, the point that uncertainty played the biggest role in, in this transitional period, it can't be emphasized enough. Um, one of the, uh, the terms that came out during this time was Calvin Ball, I believe. Uh, <laughs> where Calvin and Hobbes, uh, the, the comic strip, uh, they played a game where you made up the rules as you went along. And that was very much the case what was, uh, of what was happening in Egypt. Um, I agree with everything that everyone has said so far that, that social media does play an important role in contributing to polarization. Under Morsi, I the, the, the research that I was doing kind of looked at the three, three poles where the Muslim Brotherhood constituted a group and their leaner and their supporters. The activists and political side, and the, the then you had the military and the deep state. The Muslim Brotherhood and the activists and political side were all very engaged in social media. It wasn't until later that the military and the deep state kind of caught up, and in my opinion, really kind of manipulated the social media sphere later on down the road. Um, but really, during Morsi's presidency, it was a lot of the authoritarian, what was perceived as authoritarian tendencies, and you know, whatever your uh, position on what Morsi's policies actually were, set aside, it, the perception of the power grab by the Muslim Brotherhood really drove a lot of what we were seeing on social media at the time. Uh, the, the kind of massive outcry coming from Morsi's uh, November decree that was, you know, that claimed. Uh, essentially supreme power in Egypt. Uh, that really scared everyone based, uh, I mean, uh, on the on the history of having experienced Mubarak, being wary of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, inter, uh, the interim government, and the violence that we saw during that time, and then seeing that being played out in the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, it was extremely anti-revolutionary. And so the activists were scared, absolutely. and. The, the result was, as we saw in the video, things like the presidential palace clashes, the Etihadea clashes, um, and, and uh, uh, one video that particularly captured my imagination was uh, 
it was as the Brotherhood supporters were raiding the activists uh, that were protesting outside of the palace, uh, one Salafi individual grabbed some processed cheese and yelled to the camera, Give me this to you, my And in a, almost in a way to show that this processed cheese is evidence of a foreign conspiracy against the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, that was the kind of emotion that was coming through. Um, but the constitutional referendum itself was also, that was a, t a key turning point when, you, when activists and the politically engaged public <coughs> were really, the, the ideological battle lines were drawn. And people saw the 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 Brotherhood and the Islamist uh, backed uh, drafting committee really as hijacking this and changing Egypt for what they perceived to be the worst. Um, in, in terms of causality, you know, it's it's hard to say that social media, yes, it amplified polarization, but did it did it cause the fall, uh, the, the downfall of this transition? I mean, it's it's certainly hard to say that. Uh, you know, the the presidential elections themselves showed what was already a polarized environment. Um, you know, you had 52 percent in favor of Morsi, 48 percent in favor of Shafiq, uh, the the deep state or, or the the Mubarak era representative. Um, and you know, the, the it's pretty much down the line. Now there are different reasons, and there's a lot of research. I had written a number of articles on why uh, people voted one way or the other. A lot of it was rejecting, uh, not so much in favor of one, but rejecting the other. Um, but that polarization, that conversation, there was a conversation taking place at that time, and that slowly died out, especially as you got to the constitutional referendum and those ideological lines hardened. Um, There, there, the only possible exception really was the Tamarud movement. The Tamarud movement was the movement that quickly kind of, kind of came out of nowhere, gained very quick momentum, and even though it had a very slow start, it, it quickly reached a critical mass uh, and eventually allowed, it, it gave the military the political cover to be able to remove Morsi from power. And it was later discovered that uh, you know this did receive security apparatus support. There were local networks that you know fully backed this. There was a lot of adversity between you know between uh, you know Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the security. They saw the uh, the Brotherhoodization was a term that you saw a lot, uh, and f a lot of the the stuff that you saw on social media too was is, uh, in fear of this Brotherhoodization, this changing the character of Egypt. And when you spoke to when I spoke to uh, people from the security apparatus, they very much echoed what was uh, what was being conveyed there, and saw Morsi as trying to Brotherhoodize the police, trying to Brotherhoodize the mi the military. And were very willing to take off their uniforms and support the Tamarud movement, and some even did it in uniform. Um, the the last part of the paper that I'm really kind of torn about is this English bridge. I am a member of this English bridge, sadly. Well, sadly, I don't know. It's it's weird because. You know, the, the people that we tend to follow as analysts, we try to follow as many as possible to get as many different perspectives to try and really nail down the what, what's actually happening here. Yes, I, my, my first language, would uh, I would say, I, is English. I do speak Arabic. I read Arabic. My family is all from Egypt. Um, but in the interest of speed and trying to get these ideas quickly, I do have that bias towards an English language. Uh, but the people that I follow, the people that I trust, tended to be those that I saw also had this broad spectrum. And so it's, it's hard to say, you know, if what I was getting was a distorted view or not, because those, you know, those, even though I'd paid maybe less attention to the Arabic language than the English, I trusted that the English language was also looking at not only the activists but the the Muslim Brotherhood, 
And, and when it came to ignoring the couch party, that, well, when you, when you, you know, think about the, the kinds of things that they were posting, that's not the sort of thing that, as an analyst, you would see as politically significant. And so it, it was a natural phenomenon. Um, but the, uh, the fact that the couch party really mobilized, there was nothing to indicate that the couch party would mobilize towards, towards the Tamarud movement. Um, it wasn't until later that, that this pleasure really manifested itself and was magnified through social media that they suddenly became politically engaged, that they saw so much had gone wrong during Morsi's presidency that they were ready and willing to, to support his removal. Um, and just one quick language, uh, or one quick uh, comment on, on the fear portion of this. Egyptians are very emotional people. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have sat around an Egyptian gathering, a family dinner, uh, and really listened to the way they spoke. Uh, it's I, another point that I'd want to make is just that the very emotive, very polemic, uh, very emotional outburst is kind of typical of Egyptian culture. And so, Take it with a grain of salt, is all I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Mark. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Tarek. Uh, Sahar? And uh, Anand will get your PowerPoint going. Oh. I will not use it. Anand. 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 She's not going to use it. Good morning, everybody. Indeed, an honor and a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much, Mark, for the invitation. Um, it's really a very important and timely discussion. I had prepared a PowerPoint presentation, but my experience is when I run out of time, it's a trauma, and I get this signal like, you know, you have to finish now, and I get traumatized. So I try to decrease this trauma today by just focusing on what I really, really think is important and what I would like to share with you rather than dragging you through 20-some slides and then, oops, I'm out of time, and I did not really tell you what I think is most important here. So I want to just briefly talk about what was happening before, uh, you know, we saw this role of the Arab Spring, uh, you know, social media and the Arab Spring, how can we change our own perception or thinking about the Arab Spring itself and also about the role of social media and new media in this process? And what should we be studying or analyzing or looking at moving forward in terms of revisiting or reconsidering the role of social media, of course, with special focus on Egypt, since this is the theme of this particular panel? I think the first uh, problem was that we had some falsehood and myth about the Arab Spring or Arab Awakening movements themselves. We clustered them all in one one category, calling them quote-unquote Arab Spring or Arab Awakening movements, and that, in my opinion, overshadows some of the specific uniqueness and individuality of what is really happening and taking place inside the different countries. We cannot just talk about them in a collective sense as one cluster, Arab Spring, Arab Awakening. Now, four years later, we are very clearly seeing that what is happening in Egypt is quite different from Syria, from Bahrain, from Libya, from other uh, countries that witnessed this wave of upheaval. The second point is the term leaderless revolution which many people, many you know, scholars who wrote about this uh, process have used extensively in literature. And we talked about the leaderless revolution, leaderless revolution. I think we should take this with a grain of salt because there was indeed a form of leadership in these movements. It is just was not, it was not the uh, regular uh, authoritarian, uh, top-down structured form of leadership whereby there is a handful of party leaders telling people what to do and what to think, but rather some form of across-the-board, grassroots infused form of leadership leadership that came very much from the bottom up. So we should really reconsider this notion of, quote unquote, the leaderless revolutions. And the third, of course, point, which is very much related to what we are discussing today, is revisiting and rethinking about the role of social media in these movements. Because we did have this moment of euphoria, and myself included. And we were talking about you know, Egypt having the Facebook revolution, and Tunisia having the Twitter uprising, and Syria having the YouTube uprising. And I remember when I was giving a talk about this topic in the Woodrow Wilson Center, after I finished, the moderator said, excellent, thank you so much. But Dr. Khamis, don't you think you're a little bit upbeat? 
So I was like, yeah, maybe that was the case. Now, four years later, I'm realizing I was upbeat. At the time, I was like, no, Egyptians are making history, breaking the, you know, the barrier of fear. What are you talking about, right? Four years later, I'm like, yeah, maybe she had a point. And I'm also rethinking about my own scholarship and writing about this phenomena as well, which is really a nice segue into what we should be looking at now. What are the limitations and constraints of social media and new media as they reveal themselves four years later after the initial eruption of the so-called, quote unquote, Arab Spring or Arab Awakening movement. I think we should, number one, put the role of the social media and new media in the right perspective, meaning we should not overestimate or underestimate the role. We should move away from what is called cyber optimism or cyber pessimism into the realm of cyber realism. Cyber optimism is when you think, you know, the, the social media and new media is the end all, be all, like we said, Facebook revolution, Twitter uprising, and so on, or the underestimating them with cyber pessimism and saying, you know, these were not important. And let's just you know, put them aside and talk about uh, more important issues, social and political issues on the ground. I think uh, both approaches are faulty and have their own problems. What we need is a middle ground of cyber realism, whereby we actually reassess and revisit the role of social media in the right perspective and with the right measure. And in that sense, I would like to very much second what my uh, fellow panelists here said in terms of moving away from the notion of causality. We cannot see this as a form of you know, X causes Y, because this would be a very skewed and unrealistic representation of what is going on on the ground. The realities on the ground are very complex, and I might even use the word messy. may not be an academic term, but I think it's very messy, both politically as well as in the media domain and in the social media domain right now, that we cannot really assume any direct relationship of causality. That would be a skewed uh, representation of, of reality. The limitations and constraints also of social media that appeared four years later is very much the notion of when we had a moment of unity and uniformity, as we have seen in Tahrir Square, Egyptians across the board uh, from all different layers of society, men, women, uh, Christian, Muslim, uh, secular, Islamist, they all had one single goal, which was Mubarak must go. We, well, we all want Mubarak to go, and he must go. And you saw you know, a face-veiled woman wearing the niqab, which is the most you know, comprehensive form of veiling, holding the hand of a priest who is holding a cross in the middle of Tahrir Square, and they're both saying, you know, Mubarak must go, erhal, erhal, erhal. So that was a great moment of solidarity and uniformity. And in that sense, when you have this unified goal, everyone is calling for the very same thing, then social media can be very effective as amplifying tools. They will help you very much to spread the message and will make the message very powerful, very effective, and very loud. However, we know very well that this is not the case now. The reality is that Egyptians are now very, very fragmented, very polarized, and very divided more than ever before, even in family conversations. You know, the mom will say, if you are, you know, support, if you're not supporting Sisi and you are supporting Morsi, you're a Muslim Brotherhood. And if you're a Muslim Brotherhood, you're a terrorist. And if you're a terrorist, you're not invited for dinner. <laughs> Not even a joke. I'm like, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I appeared on Al Jazeera many times, and people are like, you appear on Al Jazeera? What does that mean? Are you supporting Morsi? Are you from the Brotherhood? Are you supporting the Brotherhood? No, I'm not. I'm not. I just have an opinion. I'm putting it across. I'm not particularly happy about my country reversing into a military dictatorship, but that's another discussion for another day. So the whole idea is that people are now polarizing and stigmatizing and alienating others. And when this deep division and depolarization happens, you really see social media and new media widening the gap and increasing the distance between the self and the other. In other in other words, they will, they will pull people apart even more because you're going to use your Facebook account to attack me, I'm going to use my Twitter account to attack you back, and before you know, we are engaging in cyber wars that are overshadowing any type of sensible, useful, or constructive dialogue because what we are interested in is not dialogue or talking or having a conversation anymore, but rather uh, you know, stigmatizing and calling others' names and very much adding to the atmosphere of polarization and uh, division and fragmentation, which is exactly what is happening now uh, in the Egyptian environment, both on the ground politically as well as in the social media sphere. Another very important part we have to look at is the learning curves. And learning curves mean we cannot assume that four years after the eruption of these movements, uh, the activists and the protesters are at the same learning point, or the regimes in power are at the same learning point. Obviously, when these movements erupted back in 2011, many regimes, including the Egyptian regime, the Tunisian regime, were completely taken by surprise. They were in a state of panic. They did not know how to respond or how to react to this new wave of activism on online. They were like, what, what can we do now? 
So they started goofing. It's not an academic term, but that's exactly what happened. They panicked, and they started to shut down the internet. The Egyptian regime shut down the internet for a whole week and cut down the cell phones. And that created a very big damage to the economy, and it also backfired. It had a counter effect. Why? Because when people cannot find their fellow activists or colleagues or friends online, they stormed out and flooded the streets in huge numbers in order to find them in Tahrir Square. So the techniques really backfired and created a counter effect or a negative effect. Now, the Syrians, for example, were looking at the Egyptians and looking at the Tunisians and building their own learning curve. So they did not you know, just shut down the whole internet for a whole week, as the Egyptians have done, or cut down the cell phone service, but rather they would cut, they would cut the internet, for example, on Thursday and Friday, which is when people are most likely to be online and to engage in social media usage. So regimes are also building the learning curves. Different groups in Egypt, as Mark pinpointed in his presentation, are also building their own social media tools or social media weapons, if you will call it. You know, If we describe this as a cyber war between different parties, then every party is using social media and new media as its own weapon to attack the others. Of course, the Ikhwan had their own you know, Ikhwan web for the Muslim Brotherhood, SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces that was in, in control of the country during the transitional period, had its own uh, Facebook page. Every group and every party on the political scene uh, created its own social media tools, which really shows this idea of building the learning curve, which is something else we as scholars and researchers should look at. What are the learning curves? How are they being built? And how are different groups and parties learning from each other and engaging in this kind of cyber war? Another important point also is the spillover from the social media domain into the mainstream media domain. That's a very important point, not just in the political realm, but I would argue beyond the politics into the social realm as well. In my second book, Egyptian Revolution 2.0, Political Blogging, Civic Engagement, and Cyber Activism, uh, sorry, political blogging, civic engagement, and citizen journalism, myself and my co-author, Mohammed Nawawi, we looked at different blogs and how they paved the way for change and for the revolution that took place in Egypt. And we saw how some of these bloggers actually broke some of the uh, taboos in Egyptian society. Not just the political taboos, such as talking about issues of corruption, governmental corruption, violations of human rights, and other types of governmental abuses, but also even uh, breaking out of the uh, taboos or the a cocoon in some of the social issues, like, for example, sexual harassment on the streets of Cairo. Some of these bloggers started for the very first time to show the graphic images of torture in the police stations, of human rights abuses, of corruption, of sexual harassment. And before you know it, mainstream media started to pick up some of these issues and started to talk about them for the very first time. So really, we have to think about this influence or this kind of crossing over from the realm of social media into mainstream media and how one of them can influence the other. Another important point also is moving away from the urban centric elitist perspective. You know, a lot of the research that has been done on the Arab Spring and social media, including in Egypt. Oh my God, one minute. All right. I'm glad I did not use my PowerPoint then. A lot of what has really uh, been happening or, or going on has been concentrated and focused on the urban areas. You know, Cairo, you know, Damascus, you know, let's talk about what's happening in the urban areas. What about the rural areas? You know, this is a very uh, big blind spot that I think we as researchers and academics should start to shift our attention to. In a country like Egypt, it's not a secret that the Muslim Brotherhood has a lot of pockets of support in many of the, uh, you know, outskirts, in many of the small towns or rural areas and remote areas, there is a big a popular base of support for the brotherhood there. Uh, are these people uh, dormant? They're not. They have their own level and form of activism, and they use different media to spread their own message. We have to shift our attention to look at this important role of these rural and uh, small areas outside of the capitals and outside of urban areas. Also, the role of interpersonal face-to-face -face communication. Oral communication and word of mouth remains to be a very, very important tool of communication, especially in this part of the world. Egypt has almost 45% illiteracy rate high poverty rate, and many areas have very poor infrastructure when it comes to technology and using new communication tools. What does that tell us in terms of the influence and the impact of the word of mouth and interpersonal face-to-face -face communication? That is something else that we should very much look at as researchers. Also, the interaction between the internal and external activists, bloggers, and other cyber activists. Uh, you know, Mark had this excellent analysis of three different types of blog, uh, blogs. The 
activist bloggers, the public sphere bloggers, and the bridge bloggers. And he talked about this bridge phenomena today. And we use this typology in our book, Egyptian Revolution 2.0. And we saw how some of these public sphere bloggers and bridge bloggers were creating, indeed, some kind of link or crossover or connection between the internal and the external, those who are inside Egypt and those who are outside Egypt. So we have to look more at the role of this internal, external interaction and the role of activists in the diaspora in terms of shaping both the realities on the ground as well as also the role of social media and new media in the process of sociopolitical uh, transformation. And finally, we are seeing now some kind of dormancy in terms of you know, this kind of cyber activism that we were very euphoric about at the beginning, like for example, the role of bloggers and so on. Many of these bloggers have now stopped blogging. Some of them shifted their attention to other areas, uh, stopped you know, their form of activism. I don't think this is a death for the process of cyber activism. I think it is dormant for some time or it's taking a different level, different shape and different form. And we have also as researchers to revisit and reconsider this whole notion of dormancy, whether this is going to be uh, you know, a long-term process, a short-term process. Are they reinventing themselves in different form and reinventing their own cyber activism in different style? These are all issues that I think we need to think about and reconsider moving forward in studying this process. Thank you so much. And uh, Alex Hanna, with laptop. What? With laptop. Yes, with laptop. We'll even drop it. All right, great. So I'd like to thank Mark for inviting me to this event and allowing me to say a few words on this on this latest blog and bullets report. Um, so this report focuses on social media use in Egypt within periods of transition rather than a time of revolution or high social movement activity. This is a really welcome and necessary intervention to figuring out how contentious politics works online and for discussing how social media can help or hurt in processes of democratization and power consolidation for that matter. So I'm a sociologist. I'm taking a little different perspective. So I'm going to draw mostly on sociological theory to discuss the report. So one of the big things that we see in sociology of culture is that people act according to different motivations in what are called, quote, settled times versus unsettled times. Uh, Anne Swidler has a big addition to the sociology of culture literature and what's called the toolkit model of culture. So people. Um, Culture is not merely a set of values on which people base their action, but it's a toolkit which includes habits, styles, and skills um, which are historically contingent and grounded. So relevant to this work is that division between settled and unsettled times. In unsettled times, say during the 18 days and the months after, people act according to explicit ideologies because there's no other uh, script in which to rely. The ideology may be political Islam uh, or a less defined uh, ideology of democratization or Western liberalism. However, in several times, people rely on traditions and common sense and fall back into those toolkits which are readily available. So we can think about in this period of transition as uh, one of those more uh, settled times. So through that lens, we can spend, uh, expect different behaviors and expressions of political action in the online sphere. Um, so uh, Mark talked about the t three types of behaviors, what they call mechanism, um, actually four, insularity, clustering, fear, and bridging. Um, I won't talk more about that. Some of the dynamics are expected given what we know about publics and other online spaces. We hear about this echo chamber, this idea of um, insularity about people talking to themselves. Um, and then U.S. politics bifurcates into divisions between left and right, and different group, types of groups uh, are more available for crossing ideological lines than others. Um, today, I want to highlight two that are theoretical points that are mainly from the social movement literature. Um, it puts many of the findings here in dialogue um, with those and addresses some of these standing questions I've been thinking about in some of my own work on social movements and social media and organizations. So first, one definitive consequence of the introduction of social media into movement repertoires has been the shifting nature of the social movement organization itself in describing what these organizations are actually capable of depending on their form. In revolutionary situations, the strongest claim, the strongest claim that we're hearing years ago, the strong claim is that social media makes organization completely unnecessary for coordination because signaling, signaling your participation is low. I'm not going to participate unless you participate, and given that we are on, all online, we can all go out on the street together. The weaker claim is that organizations play some role, but that organizations broker participation through some kind of social media engagement. Um, so these are the bookends of the claims that if you read The Logic of Connective Actions, a book by Lance Bennett and Zuckerberg, um, they, they, they talk about this. and the different types of uh, engagement and different types of organizations. 
Um, however, there are fewer indications about what kind of organizations are able to exist and thrive in non-revolutionary situations and how those organizations interact with digital media. It's in this space, I think there's a real lack of work in communications and social movement scholarship. Uh, one claim would be that there is more traditional organizations are able to weather the storm. Uh, so organizations like the Mother Muslim Brotherhood can they maintain their existence because they maintain a core membership, have coordinating leadership, money, networks, and resources that maintain all their institutional structures. But what about the dozens or even hundreds of pro-democracy organizations that seem to have formed around a revolution? Um, and so another point on that that um, Sahar talked about and I would like to address is, is the idea, uh, she uses the word dormancy and I think it's a very good term. There's a, this notion of the abeyance structure within a social movement organization. Um, so for instance, um, Verda Taylor, who's a sociologist, and one of our students, Allison Crossley, talk about this idea of the women's movement and how between the women's activism in the 1920s and the uh, activism in the 1970s, there was this doldrums uh, where there wasn't this kind of big public activism in women's spaces. And so what happens is that these fall into, um, these fall into structures called abeyance structures, and uh, most significant of these is called like a free space. So a free space is basically places where people can retreat, talk about movement repertoires, what worked, what didn't, develop collective identity, um, re look to other movements and try to get a sense of what's working for them. And so if we think about organizations that don't have a lot of that infrastructure, like the Muslim Brotherhood, a lot of these pro-democracy uh, organizations could be thought about as dormant or in abeyance, trying to regroup, trying to wait for a time of political context that is more fruitful to what what they're trying to do. Uh, stable organizations also have consequences for online movement activity. Stability in the Muslim Brotherhood's resources would allow them to have a stronger online presence, to have people dedicated to social media. If you're thinking about if they're a corporation, like a brand manager, or you, these days actually social media interns, uh, to retort and engage with people constantly. And of course, we saw this as a matter of fact, people on the Muslim Brotherhood, from within the Muslim Brotherhood, very active on Twitter, um, able to um, engage constantly to anybody who's challenging um, what they're saying. Uh, organizations that don't have stability are bound to use social media in a less uh, in a less strategic and in a less coherent manner. Uh, so spontaneous coordination is not very useful in consolidating power or trying to gain power. Um, shifting or shifting pu Egyptian public opinion and building a counterweight to the Brotherhood and the military. Um, one interesting finding of the report was this idea of the of the English bridge. So a lot of these people who are organizationally unlinked, um, they were able to leverage some of their um, I guess micro celebrity to um, uh, to reach out to English speaking networks and Western journalists. So one concrete empirical implication is the necessity of disentanglement of the different organizations within the activist cluster and super clusters. Some organizations are going to be more mobilized than others, and this is this may have some reflection in the social in social media. Getting at organizational capacity is difficult in an organizational env environment which is evolving so quickly. Things are changing incredibly quickly. Who's in what organization? Um, this is hard to track. One thing my research group is doing at the University of Wisconsin is attempting to create some measures of this in our current study. We're looking at local instantiations of the Black Lives Matter movement. So we're gathering organizational materials such as press releases, speeches, uh, longer web and Facebook posts, and to get a sense of organizational activities and capacities. Something that we could also rely on but is highly contingent on mainstream press course, uh, um, mainstream press sources is uh, protest event data, protest event data being, uh, or even mentions of these particular organizations in mainstream media. Of course, mainstream media has a bias towards um, very salient movements, and there's a whole literature on bias in terms of what actually gets picked up by mainstream media. Um, we'll get into right now. Um, but that relates to my second point. Second, it's significant that five of the seven most popular Facebook pages that we saw um, that Mark presented are those of media organizations. So we can envision the co-evolution of media as part of a co-evolution of a three-part system. So the other two parts of them are, are the state and then movement actors. The state is dominant in many ways, and the Egyptian state, whether it was under Mubarak, Morsi, Scaf, and now Sisi, have maintained efforts to direct media action and curb dissent broadcast commentators. Um, 
Morrissey's own fight to consolidate power under the presidency also meant establishing new media organizations. Um, so movements have their own their own social media expression, but they're always, they are still trying to bro uh, gain positive broadcast and broader media coverage. Uh, again, something Sahar touched on about the effect of blogs being able to bubble up into mainstream media coverage. And media institutions themselves are in the process of, process of transition, contention, and transformation by a variety of actors. So there's actually a good deal of work in the on U.S movements and how they try to gain mainstream attention. Some of the most recent work, here I'm thinking about the work of Ed Amenta, Neil Karen, and Amber Turney, focus on what social movement actions tend to lead broadcast news media to present substantive coverage of the move of movement. So they focus on the civil rights movement. They're finding that um, a lot of this action that is mainly um, dealing with parliamentary uh, and elections are things that get covered more within mainstream media publications. But uh, organizations like the Black Panther Party are covered are covered more as a crime B or in this in this more violence oriented frame. The difference is that the U.S.-based work assumes, uh, assumes a certain amount of stability in how media organizations work. Uh, these organizations are based and largely embedded in institutionalized practices, which have developed over time uh, with some discretion of particular managing and desk editors. However, in Egypt, media institutions are less settled. Uh, you have, what, three or four papers that launched right after the revolution. You had RNN. Uh, you have several television stations and a few Muslim Brotherhood stations that developed as well. Um, and then so there's just a larger amount of contention as well within the broadcast media field that people are trying to fight for and trying to uh, uh, claim a bit of. Uh, again, the concrete empirical research implications here mean focus on, focusing on the social media um, broadcast media nexus. So detecting fear within these Facebook pages is significant, but my sense is that people writing comments on these pages are doing a lot of work contending the legitimacy and market share of these particular media sources. So my work on the April 6th youth movement from 2008 shows a few things. So during days of contention, people do a lot of organizing for offline action, but in other days, people do a certain amount of reporting on events on the ground. Um, so contention around news reporting could be what's at stake on these Facebook pages more so than we see on Twitter. Um, this me. Uh, there's also a power law distribution of how people post on these pages that are, a few people post the bulk of the comments. Um, so my work also shows that posting is driven either by people who are very tied into movement work in, in, a, in a significant manner, or people are expats or observers who are participating from afar. So another question of these data would be whether these people on Facebook are tied to specific movements and movement organizations, um, and if they're part of a professional movement apparatus. Overall, uh, this is a welcome addition to the Blogs and Bullets series, and I'm hoping future work on contentious politics and social media will look more into periods of transition, particularly on movement organizational development and persistence, and how movements are taking an active role in shaping media institutions. Thank you. I want to thank uh, all of you for great presentations and really, really interesting. Um, we have about uh, 20 minutes, and uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to take uh, bunches of questions um, and uh, go to the, the panel and go back to the audience. And um, anybody want to ask any questions? That's my pen. Sorry. Uh, OK. Sure. Questions for you. Thank you all. Uh, this question is for you, Mark, or any of the other panelists, um, and it's a bit of an unfair question, I must admit, from the get-go, because I know that the data focuses okay, on the period um, <clears throat> until July 3rd of 2013, but I'm wondering if you or others could address your perceptions of the the overall period from 2011 onward, if we were to map out trends in terms of the clustering, map out trends in terms of the polarization, would this largely be a straight line from 2011 onward? Or is that 2013 moment kind of, did, did we come back and see kind of um, uh, a restart in terms of the clustering dynamics that we're seeing at play in terms of the extent of polarization. Is that changing the lines of the battlefield in some ways and um, causing a regrouping in some of the, the spheres of social media that we're seeing across the, the Egypt space? Great. Uh, BJ? 
um, kind of a, a two-part question on the on the content of what the the, the data show us. Um, there are two competing narratives that come out of of you know July third. One is popular impeachment, and the second um, is coup. You know, does the content of the dynamic inside you know, the, the Twitter uh, data set and the Facebook data set tell us, you know, does it validate one or the other? Uh, that's one question. The, the second question involves this, the, the trend that you identified, which is uh, the amplification of a unified position of change followed by a cycle of polarization um, and exclusion. Uh, what does this project in terms of of President Sisi? Do will will the, the dynamic of social media inside a political sphere inevitably produce, you know, a, a in essence a recurring cycle that now we can inevitably predict that that uh, there was a you know, unifi you know you, you were unified over what you were against, then there was polarization over what you were for, and inevitably we're going to see a repeat of that cycle. So that the, and this is not necessarily bad, but does this mm -hmm. this project that that you're going to have the politics of rejection that just recurs, you know, uh, periodically we see the same thing in, in American political science as well. I'm right here. Um, Alexandra, your research showed that um, friending people and friend selection is a very dynamic process, which I would think would create kind of a churn of ideas with that new constant evolution. Um, and yet you talk about homophilia as being one of these uh, defining characteristics of social media. So does our research show to what extent that homophilia is self-selection and to what extent that's a function of the algorithms and kind of the nature of Facebook and Twitter? And do these technology companies have some responsibility in driving that homophilia? Why don't, we, um, why don't we answer those and then um, go to the next? So the, the ones that were asked to me, um, uh, I'll do first and then we'll go. Um, and then do their, um, are, are their mics good so they don't have to stand up? Okay, good. Um, so in terms of post-July um, uh, trends and that sort of thing, so we have data actually, and this actually goes to, um, to PJ's question as well. We actually have data through Rabat, um, um, and it is a paper all of its own because there's so much of it. I mean, yeah, as you can imagine, there's an enormous spike of volume right there, and all the dynamics change uh, at, at that point. And we haven't really analyzed it yet, but um, what I can say about both the reset question and PJ's question is anecdotal and not data-driven. I'm curious what Alex has to say, since she has much more recent data on that, is that Egyptian Twitter, like most of Egyptian public sphere, has gone utterly insane. Uh, I, I mean, it, it really is just completely out of control in terms of the mutual hostility, mutual polarization, and just the, the, the sheer nature of the attacks on each side. I think some part of that is what Alex was talking about in terms of the policing of the media narratives. Um, this has been a huge part of post-2013, has been the, com the competition to define what it actually is. But I don't think that it has settled into a, uh, a single resolved narrative. I think you have two resolved narratives that are mutually incompatible and um, are pretty iron solid at this point. The Rabah narrative has become, I think, the it's, I think the new foundation of Muslim Brotherhood identity is the Rabah martyrdom narrative, and and then you have the Sisi narrative, which is relentlessly policed and promoted and enthusiastically supported by that water bottle, um, uh, enthusiastically supported by very significant numbers of Egyptians. Um, often, uh, you might think they're coming from the couch party. That would be a good guess. Many of them are activists, though, and coming from the old political public or kind of like political actors who have now reconciled themselves to the realities of power, you know, that sort of thing. I think one of the big open questions, and this was hinted at uh, by, by Tarak and uh, by Sahar, is that how much of that is actually state mobilized versus authentic expressions of individual beliefs. And I think that's one of those big unanswered questions that the data can't, the data that we have cannot answer that question. We did have a researcher in our, in our uh, Stanford study group who did some pioneering work on detecting uh, bots and like that kind of automated commenting behavior 
behavior, but um, we didn't see any sign of that in, in Egypt. I think the mechanisms and, and the, the, by the way this is done is different. Um, uh, so, um, so I, I, I kind of leave that there. Um, Alex, you had a couple questions. Yeah, sure. So first I'll address the issue of overall polarization and then get at this churn and homophily question. So I think you're right. We now do see this sort of intense dynamic where you have the kind of post rebel Adawiya Islamist camp and then this sort of nationalist pro CC camp that make a lot of noise on Twitter. And when we look at the individual networks, if you just kind of pull up a user's network online, you can really see these divisions, these polarized Islamists. Many of their friends have the Rebel Adawiya four-finger symbol with the yellow logo. It's where, really convenient. Yeah, it's very convenient for identifying them, yes. And the CC supporters, on the other hand, will have Egyptian flags or this, this sort of very common image that has CC's head and it says CC Raisi or CC is my president underneath. So you really do see this kind of split dynamic. But as I mentioned in my presentation, we do see as well a lot of people advocating against this and discussing the sort of general state of repression in Egypt as it applies to both secular activists and Islamists. And so those voices have not gone away entirely. And I think this gets it also. What Sahar was talking about, about sort of different strategies of the activist community in this period, maybe we're not seeing those voices elevated to the same degree. But when I did more individual level analysis, they do still seem to be there. Um, and then with regard to the churn and homophily issue, I think you're right. We do have these kind of dynamic shifting networks and the suggestions that Twitter algorithms make to people may play a role in who they choose to follow. But because people do seem to be kind of constantly curating and changing their networks through these active and passive channels, there's a lot of unfollowing that goes on too. So you might follow three more Islamists because Twitter suggests that to you, but then and if you uh, find it sort of too much content clogging up your feed or you're not interested or you don't like the tone, people are then unfollowing as well. So I wouldn't say that we necessarily have this dynamic where the algorithms themselves are driving the polarization. I just think it's useful to bear in mind these active and passive channels through which networks initially form. Can I just add to that? I mean, anyone who is involved in kind of the Egyptian online sphere knows about the great unfriending, um, which, which, which was associated with a coup. I mean, I mean, basically, Facebook friends were purged wildly along these ideological lines, and long-standing Twitter friends. I mean, this was an incredibly divisive, violent, and um, unsettling period. And people that you saw in real, not just in the data, but in real life, we saw all of our own personal, social, political networks torn to pieces over this. And I think that that's a, a big part of it. So Alex and I, Alex and, and the Blocks and Bullets team, we're measuring different things. We're measuring retweet networks um, in terms of behavior. And she's measuring um, the uh, the actual friend list, and it's actually interesting that I think the findings are very commensurate. I mean, mm -hmm. I think they, they look very similar. So that's actually a nice. Uh, it's nice to see that uh, that coming together. Yes. The only thing, the other thing I would add before going to Tarek and, and Sahar is that I think, in getting back to your point, P, your question, PJ, is that I think right now, as opposed to, say, three months ago, I, I, I sense more of a softening of at least uh, the, the, the pro CC narrative as people are starting to say, you know, this isn't really what we signed up for, this is really horrible. And I think that this notion of dormancy, or Alex's point about like retreating back into a free space, um, again, this is not at all supported by the data we have here, but my, my sense of what's going on is that there is a lot of that going on. There's the, the, the kind of, that that narrative is hardening. The idea that we need to defend this to the death is uh, is fading a little bit for a lot of people, and you're seeing more questioning. And I would suspect um, more kind of tentative reaching out across ideological lines. You know, I haven't talked to you for two years. Maybe we should have coffee, like that sort of thing. But I don't think it's manifesting publicly yet. It, it might, but I think that's the sort of thing, which this is pure anecdote and personal experience here. I just want to comment on uh, PJ. I like the point about the recurrence or the cycle. You know, I, that's a question I ask my students. Like, you know, what do you think is going to happen next? I don't have an answer myself, but let's think about it. What do you speculate might happen next? And I think it's very hard to really kind of come up with some kind of trajectory as to when and how this might happen. The whole idea of the recurrence or the cycle makes a lot of sense to me. 
but the shape and the form and also the timing or the framework is going to take for this to happen is very hard to determine or to anticipate because of the whole situation being influxed, the political system being influxed, and also the social media role is changing and in transition as we are seeing it right now. Can I just take the opportunity of just making two points I, I forgot to mention in my word, in my... <laughs> Please, Mark. I don't know, please. it's kind of an abuse, <laughs> but um, we'll allow it. <laughs> Just quickly, right? Quickly, yeah. One point is about really the whole notion of slacktivism or clicktivism, which means that, you know, we have been in this euphoria about social media and new media. We did not pay enough attention to how sometimes the activists would really have their online activism, and sometimes that would not necessarily spill over or translate into actual action on the ground. I remember there was one group that was formed, I think, after the revolution that was called clicking the mouse behind your computer screen will not change the world. So, in other words, they were t telling us clearly that just, you know, sending links and being activist online does not necessarily s spill over or translate into actual activism on the ground, because people can simply be trans you know, substituting or replacing words for action. So this notion of slacktivism and clicktivism is something we should really look at very carefully. Another thing, we cannot just cluster the role of social media and new media in one category. We have to look at what each and every tool or medium is good at, meaning that Facebook is best in mobilization and networking. Uh, you know, blogs are best in brainstorming and exchange of ideas and, you know, dialogue and conversation and deliberation. Twitter is best for on-the-ground, minute-by-minute organization, like we have seen in the book tweets from Tahrir. You know, go to this street, don't go here, go there, avoid this street, you know, use this and that on the ground. And, of course, YouTube is best for the purpose of documentation and showing us what is really happening. If it was not for YouTube, we will have no clue what is happening in a country like Syria, where there are no foreign journalists, and we can see what's happening because of the YouTube uh, videos. Uh, another very important uh, point as well is also thinking about um this whole notion of the vacuum in civil society. Now we are clearly seeing that ousting a dictator from office is easy, but figuring out what to do next is definitely not easy at all. And the vacuum in civil society means we are having shortage in civil society organizations, no organized, structured political parties of resistance or opposition, and social media alone cannot be magical tools, and they cannot fill this void or this emptiness in civil society structures and institutions, which is something else that we as researchers have to pay attention to and to focus on looking ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Alex? Uh, oh, yeah, you want to? Okay. Just building on something Sahar was saying to PJ's question, especially about this idea of, of is social media going to be this cyclic thing? I think there's some interesting work that uh, Gary King and Jennifer Pan and Molly Roberts have where it's looking at censorship in China and how um, what actually gets through uh, Chinese censorship, what actually what gets censored, and they're finding that things are things that relate to expression are more likely to get through, while things relating to action uh, are, are more likely to get censored. So it's you have this coevolution that happens between state, the state, and social media activists. And so once the state figures out, that, as Sahar was saying, the state is figuring out new repressive strategies, and social media activists are adapting. And there's different ways in which social media tools are being used in different ways. So I. Uh, I, I, I think I, in those papers I've read some other place or heard some other place, what happens in China is that someone's using this thing and it's a word that looks like protest but doesn't mean protest and it's actually, but it, 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 it's the same kind of signifier. Um, and so it's this, it's this arms race and, if, you know, on, on one level you have a giant state, state apparatus that might be um, dedicating a lot of people to it, but then you also have this big crowdsourced source of people to do it. Um, whether it can occur within these existing technologies, that might be another question. That's an open question. Sahar is also a very excellent point. Different technologies are good for different things. And so it might be another thing, another kind of technology that comes out that becomes a, a, a thing that is a uh, organizing tool. We could see things that are these proliferate, per, proliferations of anonymous social networks like Whisper or Yik Yak or whatever. Mm -hmm. And these might be these, these edge cases which really start and we see the mobilization and activism focusing around those platforms. Doug? Um, just to build a little bit on that, I think Alex is absolutely right. Uh, it's particularly after uh, it became clear that the, the current Egyptian regime was not going to tolerate any sort of political dissent. You did see, I mean, I, within my own personal activist and political uh, community, you did see a migration to other platforms, w ones with higher encryption, ones that, you know, really uh, were, were conscien conscience, conscious 
conscious of the fact that the the regime was now l looking at bloggers, looking at uh, social media users, trying to target them, identify them, and target them, and shut them down. Um, and and so that's uh, that was something that that really uh, it, it's it makes the the conversation go underground, but it doesn't stop the conversation. And the, the activists are constantly going to evolve um, in, in accordance with the state. Uh, just a comment on how people behaved from whether or not the the. Social media dynamic changed. Uh, I mean, again, because the data is still raw, uh, that'll require that'll uh, need some more examination. But, but I think the 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 nail in the coffin of the revolution began with the coup, began with this whole debate over impeachment, popular or, or military coup, um, and and ended with Rabah. Um, yeah. That was really sort of the the final death knell right there, and. At that point, yes, the, the the two groups were homogenized. You did see a little sliver of difference uh, in in Mark's graph, uh, talking about the polarity there uh, of the superclusters. That tiny sliver of difference there was the sort of the, the third way, the people who are still thinking that neither the military nor the Brotherhood are right. We, there, there still is a democratizing movement here. I think that sliver has grown, uh, it, it has recovered a little bit. But again, all this conversation is underground. How it might impact Sisi is what's going to be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Sisi's regime is still evolving. It's still trying to find its own political order. Um, it's extremely controlling, extremely authoritarian, repressive, and, and all that. But Sisi is dealing with a very different Egypt than Mubarak dealt with in pre-2011. Um, right now, you're, you're looking at a, an extremely fragmented state where you have different parts of the bureaucracy act as fiefdoms, all of, all of which are trying to serve the president but in their own interpretation of what the president wants and in their own way, and at Paramount, protecting their own interests. Uh, and so how that dynamic plays out will depend on how this political body evolves. And, and it'll be really interesting to see how the addition of a new parliament will change this dynamic. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I would love to take more questions, but we were actually at 11 o'clock, and we have, uh, uh, and then we do, we have, we have coffee and and treats, <laughs> this coffee um, outside. So let's take a, a brief 15-minute break, and then we'll come back and uh, we'll hear from uh, Michael Posner. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you uh, for uh, for sticking around for the second session. I am a I'm delighted to be able to welcome our, our keynote speaker, uh, Michael Posner. He's a professor of ethics and finance at, at, at uh, NYU School of Business and the co-director of the really quite innovative uh, 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 NYU Stern Center for the Incorporation of Human Rights into uh, the Study of Business and Finance. Um, and he was, as I mentioned before, from 2009 to 2013, he was Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, for democracy and human rights, and in that context, he was known in the uh, in, in the Washington uh, community as one of uh, one of the absolute best in terms of reaching out to the policy community and and, and reaching out to uh, voices from the region and constantly engaging with us. And um, you know, it was really a model of openness in terms of trying to uh, interact with uh, experts and with uh, the the people from the region who were being affected. Um, and I remember long conversations about Bahrain, about Egypt, and uh, I think really just a phenomenal job that he did uh, over the period that covered the Arab Spring, and um, I assume we'll hear something about that. Um, as, so, as most of you probably know, before joining the administration, he was the founder and longtime director of Human Rights First, where uh, he helped to uh, shape, I would say, the global discourse and practice of human rights, and so I'm absolutely delighted to have you here to join us today. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm really uh, delighted to be here, and 
Um, I'm also especially delighted uh, uh, to uh, be part of this and your really wonderful initiative, uh, blogs, and, uh, uh, bullet, blogs and Bullets. I was for several years when I was at State also on the uh, board of USIP and really came to appreciate the 30 years of uh, extraordinary work, both the depth and breadth of, of what, uh, what USIP does, so it's a great collaboration. As Mark says, that my perspective is that of longtime NGO activists and then period of time in the government dealing with these issues, uh, especially dealing with the Arab Spring and now in the academic world. Um, I want to do three things here, I, and I'm going to take the discussion broader and then bring it back. I want to take a kind of 30,000 foot look at the history of how human rights issues relating to free expression, assembly, and association play out and how that sets the frame for this. Second, I want to react a little bit on the social media and transition discussions we've had so far this morning um, and talk maybe a, a few, say a few words about Egypt in particular. And then I want to lay out a few things of a forward agenda. I want to start with the premise, though. We live in a world, we we're talking about Egypt. We've talked a lot this morning about Egypt, country with 90 million people. It's the most important country politically, culturally, historically in the Arab world. But we live in a world where a majority of the world's population lives in countries um, that are essentially uh, insecure, um, controlling environment uh, where governments are terrified of pluralism, of dissent, and of active political participation. What we're talking about relating to Egypt applies to China, it applies to Russia, it applies in so many places. In fact, uh, <clears throat> the Indian government is at war now with the Ford Foundation. So if you look at the kind of global picture, we are dealing with a world of highly insecure governments that are terrified of dissent and the new social media plays on all of their worst anxieties. So that's the starting point for me. And then you sort of look at the history of this and recognize how recent the human rights discussion even is, these discussions of um, free speech, free association, free press across borders. Um, World War II, the end of World War II, the creation of the UN was a kind of uh, watershed because of the Holocaust. There was a recognition that there needed to be a global system and a lot of governments came into that reluctantly, but with a view that they somehow still would maintain control. So the UN Charter basically is a three-legged stool. It talks about security, the kinds of issues USIP works on, creation of the Security Council trying to prevent warfare. Um, development, the whole range of issues relating to populations that are uh, desperately poor and disadvantaged, creation of UNDP, World Health Organization, UNESCO, etc. And then the third leg of the stool was human rights. It was built into the charter. And it was built into the charter with an, an obvious tension with sovereignty. Um, there's a provision of the Charter that says non-intervention in domestic affairs, and there are provisions of the Charter that say, but when a country violates broad notions of human rights, it's everybody's business. And so in the 40s and early 50s, the UN adopted a universal declaration of human rights, a manifesto common standard for everybody. You're entitled to certain rights by virtue of hu your humanity, Eleanor Roosevelt and the US, of course, in the lead. Um, and then a, a series of treaties. The treaties assume free speech, free assembly, free association, and some political rights that go with that. But there was a recognition at that time, I think by a lot of the governments that were part of it and that came into the system, that this was really a kind of diplomatic dance among governments. And to the extent that individuals were implicated, they were third party beneficiaries. It wasn't about actually implementing. And what's happened over the last 50 years, certainly 55, 60 years, is that the debate has changed in part because of citizen participation, the growth of an NGO movement, which was very much in its embryonic stages in the 50s, the growth, the globalization of the economy, that's what I'm working on at Stern, the fact that half the biggest economies of the world are not states, they're private companies, Walmart's the 30th biggest economy in the world, comparing revenues 
use to gross domestic product. We've got a globalized economy. We've got greater transportation. We've got enhanced communication. And we've got an internal dissent, growing dissent within these closed societies. And it's, uh, to use a diplomatic term, freaking governments out like the CC government. <laughs> this is a, a prescription for their failing because they're losing control. So when we talk about the internet, um, and, and I'm very proud of the fact that in the years I was in the State Department, we, uh, Secretary Clinton gave three major speeches on internet freedom. We talked about the internet as being the town square of the 21st century. We talked about an open, neutral platform for commerce, education, innovation, and political uh, expression. Um, I still believe in that, and I think in, I, I'm very taken by and, and really was fascinated by the findings that Mark and others um, outlined here, but I think we have to hold our nerve on the notion that um, there are all kinds of challenges uh, with the Internet, uh, which have been laid out in, in uh, gory detail this morning. And as Mark and others have said, the internet both empowers and it endangers. Um, but we ought to start from the premise that this is a human rights debate. It's about free speech. It's about the ability of people to express their views in their own societies and more globally. That's really what this is about. And there are lots of reasons we ought to be nervous about the misuse of the social media, both by citizens who are angry and polarized, that's clear, by governments that want to misuse the system. Um, but we also ought to recognize the great potential. When we look at a country like Egypt, and it is, I think, an exemplar of the kinds of things we're seeing in lots of places, all, some of the things I talked about are, um, are, are, are dominant, and they've been dominant for decades. Uh, there is an absence of pluralism. Uh, the Mubarak administration, very much like the Soviet Union, controlled everything. Everything was centrally controlled. They controlled the media. They put t a huge amount of money into an overblown media establishment. They controlled the economy, they controlled security, they controlled political opposition. There were sort of pretend political parties that never really had the ability to, never were nurtured. Um, the one exception was that in the social space they gave a place for the Muslim brothers and their affiliates to deal with things like health and education, in part because the government was incapable, didn't have the resources to do it. So it was a very immature political system that came, uh, uh, became obvious uh, when Tahrir Square erupted. And the day after, that important day after when people said, oh, let's organize, the, the muscles weren't there. The system wasn't there. The history wasn't there. The training wasn't there. One of the things that was most deeply frustrating to me in government was the kind of impatience of people in our own government who said, oh yeah, 18 days, now where's the political opposition? The political opposition was simply incapable of organizing themselves having been in the void for so long. And lots of things evolved from that, one of which was, of course, that the Muslim brothers, because they were the most organized, became the only alternative. Not a great alternative. Most people in the country didn't really like what they stood for, but they represented something other than the old order. And so the, the public debate, the debate you've been talking about this morning in terms of social media, is a reflection of that larger political reality. And one of the things that I found, I worked, I was in Egypt a number of times in 2010 before Tahrir. I was there when it happened, or right after it happened, and then I was there during the MB period. Um, it was clear that the Muslim Brothers had the same absolutist view of central state control. Their views, version of a, con of a constitution was the kind of mere image. Um, they wanted to have uh, all of the things that they believed in imposed on a society. They didn't want openness. They didn't want a public debate. The process was flawed. The product was flawed. And so we, we uh, recognize today as we look at what happened, what's been happening in the future, um, that uh, in, in Egypt, we realize that social media uh, is, not a tool, is a tool, it's not a substitute for the kind of political evolution that societies need. To me, that's the key point here. 
We shouldn't reject social media or its potential because its potential is enormous. Um, it's all of the history of political speech, free speech, demonstrations, the mimeograph machine, everything everybody's ever done to organize politically on steroids. It creates, it accelerates, it amplifies. It's a more important way of communicating than the world has ever seen. We need to recognize its power, and we also need, as Mark and, and everybody's done today, to recognize that in an immature political environment where people are trying to make sense of things, the potential for polarization, the potential for misuse is only going to be exaggerated, and you have governments that are going to exploit that and, in fact, take advantage of it uh, to promote their own means. That's what's happening in Egypt today. I was struck in one of the earlier papers that uh, was done that there were five categories that were laid out, which I think are useful for us to kind of look at if we're trying to do a report card on social media and transition. Uh, the first being what they call individual transformation. Uh, maybe the hardest to judge because you don't know what's going on in somebody's living room or in their bedroom as they're sitting in front of a computer screen. I don't think there's any question, though, that people today are better informed, uh, both about what's happening in their own society. They may have a skewed vision of it, but they're getting information at a level they've never gotten, but also on a comparative basis. And that's one of the things that I think scares governments the most. Why are we living like this? Look what's going on over there. Um, if I were running the government of Iran today, that would be one of the things that would make me anxious to keep the internet, the halal internet, to keep it controlled to my own society. I don't want people in my own society seeing what it looks like in Paris. Um, the second is intergroup relations, and I don't think there's any question that intergroup Contact is greater, um, and that's a potentially positive thing, but again, the polarization uh, is, is also a huge piece of that. And polarization, again, in societies that are fractured, is more likely to be more acute. We see it even in our own media, though, in our own mainstream media. I was struck the other day when the Pope spoke at the, uh, at, to Congress. I went to look at the New York Times, which said, Pope speaks about climate change and inequality. Fox News, same minute, Pope speaks about uh, the sanctity of life. Same speech. Uh, and he did, in fact, talk about all that. Um, but if, if, we, if, if American mainstream news can do that, why shouldn't the internet in Egypt be polarized? The third category, which I think is the one perhaps people have put too much attention to, is the internet as a tool for collective action. Um, the reality is people, it's, it's a tool. It can help maybe get people to the street to the same location at the same time. It doesn't build political movements. And perhaps, again, going back to Egypt, the Tahrir Square post the day after is a reflection of that. It was possible to get people mobilized in an, at a moment in time for a very simple purpose, to take to the streets to condemn all the things they didn't like. It didn't create a political movement. And I think we overestimated, you know, the, the Twitter, the Facebook revolution. It wasn't a revolution. It was a decapitation of a corrupt head, and then the process of trying to build an a, a alternative political order required more than tweets. And then fourth is the category of governments, and uh, Mark and I were talking about this a little bit. I think a lot more has to be focused on how governments use and misuse the internet, the Chinese 50 cent movement, the energy and attention the Chinese spend trying to control, control, control data. Uh, the extent to which uh, governments use surveillance, they use all dis the disruptive techniques. Governments are terrified of this new social media, and they are spending enormous time and energy trying to control it, to capture it, and to delegitimize those um, who are uh, using it in ways to criticize them. They're afraid of exposés. They don't like people to know that they're corrupt and illegitimate. They're afraid of... Uh, the connection to the outside world, and they're afraid of the internal capacity of people to connect with one another. Uh, it's why so many bloggers are being attacked in places like Azerbaijan, Turkey, Russia, China. Um, this is a phenomenon. One of the last things I did in government was to write to Secretary Clinton a memo that I call the headwinds. 
and I looked at the range of ways that uh, nervous governments, these authoritarian governments that are anxious, um, were passing new laws on NGOs, on foreign funding, on media freedom, national security laws, everything justified on a sort of post 9-11. This is all about national security. In that mix are laws governing the internet, we saw it across the board, across regions, and attacks against bloggers who are um, on the front lines of this discussion. So I think we need to spend more time on government and the nefarious role they play. And then the fifth category, outside pressure, external attention. Again, this is one where I think we sort of overestimate. One of the things when it came into the State Department, we were assigned to work on an internet freedom agenda. Um, the secretary gave speeches. We did an internal process. There was a funding component. There was $15 million from Congress. All of it intended, frankly, to go uh, to tear down the uh, Chinese firewall or the firewall in Iran. Uh, the notion was we need the voice of America to be broadcasting in. Um, frankly, most people in China China and Iran are more interested in talking to each other. They're more interested in an open, neutral internet than are uh, trying to figure out how to broadcast in our own view of the world. Um, the world changes in part because of external pressure, but essentially my view, having worked in human rights for a long time, is that change occurs from within. Our job is to reinforce and empower people within their own societies, and we do that in several different ways. We need to provide a lifeline, and so here I come to sort of where do we go from here. We need to double down on the internet, and the, the internet is an open tool. It's a tool for change. But it, again, it's subject to use or misuse depending on how it's applied. We've got to provide a lifeline to the people who are trying to use it properly. We don't do that enough. We don't do it systematically enough. We have to challenge the constraints that some governments, again the Chinese and Russians among others, are trying to place on how the internet is governed. The internet grew up in a kind of chaotic way. It's a multi-stakeholder model. We need to keep it that way. Governments are desperate to control content because they're afraid of what their dissident populations are going to say about them. The International Telegraphic Union has set up this thing called the Wicket, which is a kind of effort to govern. The Chinese are coming to the UN. They can't wait to govern the internet in a way that will control content. We've got to be mindful of that and we've got to fight back. Um, we also need to f be focused on what we say and do on policy, in policy terms, and hold our nerve. Um, Sisi has doubled down on the security state control model. He's, he's doing what Mubarak did, maybe even more uh, grossly. Um, we have to take a long-term view. Um, that supports the democratic forces in these closed societies, in these uh, undemocratic societies. Um, we have to say it publicly. I saw CC interviewed last night, President CC on TV, um, confident that the United States supports him more than ever. He shouldn't feel so confident. We had to make it clear to him that the things he's doing are not the right things, they're not consistent with our own uh, interests and values, and there is a price to be paid for. We're not doing that in Egypt and in many other places. I was pleased yesterday to see that the president on Syria um, was clear about the uh, uh, pernicious effect of the Assad regime. Um, we have such a tendency to waffle when we get into tough places. ISIS is the embodiment of evil, but the Assad regime has also uh, caused the greatest amount of danger and damage there. People are fleeing the regime as much as they're fleeing ISIS, and we need to be crystal clear that Assad is part of the problem. We need to be clear about Saudi Arabia. Um, part of the challenge we have in the social media space is that, and again, I'm speaking as somebody who used to be in the government, and PJ will know I used to try to say these things internally, and as much as I was permitted externally, um, we have to be clear about, we have to speak the truth. And social, you know, we, there's a lot of debate now in the U.S. government. Why is ISIS recruiting 30,000 people? Why are they doing 90,000 tweets a day? Why are they so effective? They're effective because their message is not being responded to with moral and political clarity. 
we need to say what we believe is the truth, which is that regimes in the region are not democratic, they're not stable, they're not protecting their own people. If we say that, that is a response to ISIS. ISIS is a response to the lack of legitimacy in the region. Again, evil as can be, we should destroy them. I am not, I don't hold a can, I don't hold any brief for them, but we need to be aware of what's drawing people to their side. So I think at the end of the day, and I'll stop here, social media in times of transition is a tool we need to amplify the extent to which it's a tool for good. We need to be absolutely clear-eyed about how governments are going to misuse it. And we should not be surprised, and we need to do everything we can to dissipate the kind of polarization and uh, malevolent use of the Internet that Mark and others have, uh, have described so clearly. Let me stop with that. Um, you can call Please, go ahead. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about the UN General Assembly's passage of the Sustainable Development Goals and how that influences the information ecosystem. Information ecosystem, the information ecosystem, and how potentially inserting into those sustainable development goals was not uh, an emphasis on building out media systems, sustaining media development globally, particularly as we look at <laughs> transparency and accountability systems. You've talked about governments that are unstable, that aren't transparent, that aren't accountable, and where media plays that role, the Sustainable Development Goals could have been effective. It's a good question, and I haven't really focused on that aspect. What I am aware of is that the, the uh, Development Goals are already have a feeling of kitchen sink. There's 16, 17 goals with sub-goals, working groups. Um, it's an unbelievably ambitious agenda, and I'm sure there are many other things that were kept out. I think the essence of your question is right, that governments, again, this sort of reinforces the sort of central thesis of what I was saying. Governments are willing to engage in the UN agenda on the development side, for example, to the extent they keep control. The government of Egypt was happy to have USAID in Egypt as long as the ministries could decide what projects got accepted. Um, when NDI or IRI or Freedom House went to do political training, uh, the government said this is an illegitimate interference in our domestic affairs. So I think the development agenda needs to be Mind for those involved in the development agenda, and I support that. I mean, we've lifted two billion people out of poverty in the last 25 years, which is extraordinary. But we've got to be mindful of the tendency of these governments that are not democratic to manipulate a development agenda and say, oh, political openness, internal debate, transparency, oh, that's a different subject. It's not a different subject at all. One of the reasons that development fails in so many places is because the governments are so closed and corrupt. You know, if, if half the aid dollars arrive in their destination in a lot of countries, we're, we feel like we've succeeded. Um, that's a ridiculous way to operate. And I think for the UN and for governments that are supporting the development agenda, we have to start by talking about integrity and making sure that there is openness and transparency and that governments are actually accountable to their own people. I don't know if that answer gets it where you were. Please, others. Please, go ahead. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation. I think uh, what you said is exactly what needs to be said and what needs to be. Thank you. Thanks for the excellent presentation. What you said is exactly what needs to be said and what needs to be done. But um, I think that uh, in my part of the world, in, in Egypt in particular, there is this general sentiment that, uh, you know, for a long time, uh, you know, dictatorial regimes, authoritarian regimes like the Mubarak regime, it's no secret, has been receiving you know, support from the West, from the U.S. in order to stay in power as, uh, you know, a way of quote unquote <coughs> keeping stability uh, in the region. That was the claim that Mubarak at least was voicing. That it's either me or chaos, me or anarchy. 
So uh, now there is this kind of, you know, uh, is it back to the same old, same old? In other words, we have now a more even repressive regime, which has a lot of human rights violations, curbing press freedom, curbing freedom of expression. And like you said, you know, there is really a need to show CC that, you know, this is not the way it should be, and that the U.S. government can and should take some kind of action to show at least this satisfaction. And I think that there's a sentiment that not enough of that has been done. And I want to just ask you as to why this is the case and what could be done about it. And can we expect a different trajectory moving forward that does not you know, protect <clears throat> these kinds of regimes under the claim of stability, but shows a different course of action? Thank you. So I, two reactions to that. Uh, I essentially agree with your hypothesis. I'll say something about that in a minute. But I want to say at the uh, before that, one of the things that was, I've been going to Egypt probably since 1990. I've gone a lot. And I have a sense of how things operate. And one of the things that was really striking to me, almost breathtaking, was the extent to which Egyptians on all sides had a feeling that somehow whatever went wrong, the United States was behind it. Um, I would go and visit the, when Morsi was in power, I was in the presidential palace, and his senior aides, some of whom are now in jail, would look outside and they say, the police there, they don't support us. Will you go tell them that they have to protect us. Uh, I would talk to Al-Baradai and others, and he would have complaints about the electoral system. Will you go tell the government they have to change it? Um, the Christi, uh, 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 Coptic Christian community, absolutely convinced that we put Morsi in power. We had wild conversations. And so part of what I think is part of that maturing process, and it's not only in Egypt, but it was, it's, it's acute there, is a sense that Egyptians really do control their own destiny. The United States undoubtedly, over a long period of time, has done a lot of things that I don't agree with. And the reasons, some of which are pretty obvious, relations with Israel, Camp David, concerns about Gulf security, the Suez Canal, worries about security in the Sinai. There's a long list of security reasons that are legitimate reasons, and we can debate some of them, but we can certainly say that there is a rational basis for maintaining a relationship with the Egyptian government. That doesn't mean, in my judgment, that you pretend that, the, that white is black or that it's day when it's night. There is a series of repressive actions that are going on now, uh, an absolute um, cross-the-board effort to silence dissent. There are tens of thousands of people in jail. The media is being muzzled. Those are outrageous acts. Um, there was a coup. We didn't say it, and we should have said it. So all of those things, I think, actually work to the detriment. This was my argument, obviously, one voice. It works to the detriment of the U.S. when it's not more straightforward about asserting what everybody knows to be true. That doesn't mean you throw out the relationship, but it does mean that you make that a higher priority. And I think we always need to do that. We need to be mindful. We should be doing it now. We should do, be doing it more. God, this is a polite group. Some, I must have offended somebody. Yeah, please. <laughs> Um, so I was really interested in the comments you ha made about social media and countering um, ISIS, particularly about recruitment and um, what we can do um, both as actors outside of government and in government to kind of um, try and stem what's going on with that, considering um, it looks like the U.S. government and um, I'm doing research about U.S. and Russia relations as they mm -hmm. pertain to countering ISIS, and kind of um, those seem like the recruitment part seems like it's something we haven't quite gotten our hands wrapped around in terms of how, how to stem that. So I was wondering what your thoughts might be. Yeah, I mean, I think this is actually something that um, it seems both obvious to me, but it seems extremely hard for the U.S. government to do it. Um, the U.S. government, uh, certainly since the Arab Spring period, has spent an enormous amount of time trying to figure out how to use social media to get across our talking points, our message. The talking points don't resonate. And so part of the appeal of ISIS, again, I, I, ISIS is evil, so I, I want to be clear about that. But part of their message 
that does resonate is a denunciation of autocratic governments in the region. They represent a violent reaction to governments that have not been representative of their people's interests. So they're recruiting people from Saudi Arabia, from Egypt, from all over the region, and they're reaching out to people all over the world to say, we're fighting against these entrenched governments that have been uh, uh, disrespectful and abusive of their own people for a long time, help us join that fight. It's a pretty simple message. And the alternative to it has to be a recognition that there's an element of truth to what they say in terms of the need for fundamental reform in, in the Arab world, but that their method and their alternative is a worse alternative. And so um, finding a better set of talking points and a more um, uh, honest and holistic view of what's actually going on, I think will make the uh, social media response of the U.S. and the West a lot more effective. Please. One more. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, please. Thank you. Uh, there's one call question oh. back there. Did you have a question? Who? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, just adding on that last point, Maria Stefan from, from the Institute. Um, on, you know, the part of the ISIS narrative that's most compelling is, you know, we are resisting uh, oppression and authoritarianism, and we provide the means to fight effectively. And I think part of the counter message has to be not only a narrative, a different framing, but also, you know, demonstrating that, in fact, there is a different way to fight for rights, uh, for freedoms effectively that just involve different weapons. Um, and in fact, these nonviolent movements have done more more to effectively challenge authoritarian regimes and autocratic regimes than any violent insurgency or movement historically has done. So I think that has to be part going beyond the words and beyond the frames. Here is a different methodology of fighting. It's been incredibly effective. Here are activists that have used it very effectively, and this is just a way to sort of challenge the whole uh, sense of supremacy over the method of struggle. Yeah, I agree, and I, you know, I think that we need to hold our nerve also in terms of what are the core values that underlie our foreign policy, who we are as a people, and to try to amplify and, and push those things out globally and to say these are the things we also hope, we want to support the people in the world that share our approach, our, approach our, our, our sense of what the world is like. There are lots of Democrats, there are lots of people who believe in human rights, there are lots of people who believe that women are entitled to dignity in the Arab world. And we ought to be signaling to them, we're, you're the preferred uh, ally of the United States. We're going to do whatever we can to reinforce what you're trying to do in your own societies. And make that clear. Make it clear that we stand for those values, and that's part of the way we in which would like to uh, see the, the debate play out in the region. Thank you. Thank you. So, we're going to go directly on to the next panel. Before I turn it over to my GW colleagues, Sean Ade and Adrian and Joshua, I just want to introduce uh, Dean Freelon, who is one of the co-authors of the report, who had to come in late. Uh, Dean is a, a core part of the team, and I wanted to be sure everybody got to acknowledge him. Thank you. If you want, and then we'll have our discussion. Okay, yeah, okay. okay great. Are you make one. Sean, do you have an order? Well, uh, you're first. Oh, I'm first. Yeah. Um, you're going to introduce? Yeah, I will. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, one of the uh, things that we definitely wanted to do today was, uh, even though our report is really focused on the Egyptian case and a lot of the discussion has been, uh, that we wanted to have a panel like this where we can really branch out uh, and talk about um, how the kinds of things we've discussed this morning apply to other situations as well or not. So, um, one of the important things for, for scholars, obviously, is um, trying not 
to overdetermine things or act as if you know our case study speaks for everything. Uh, and so our speakers today uh, for this panel, I think, are going to uh, do an excellent job of sort of expanding the discussion to other case studies and helping us understand what is and is not applicable from the Egyptian case uh, to other cases to help us have a better, maybe more general understanding of the dynamics that uh, that we're talking about and dealing with. So um, first is uh, uh, Joshua Tucker, professor of politics at New York University, um, and by courtesy, Russian and Slavic studies at NYU with an affiliate appointment at NYU Abu Dhabi. He's co-PI of the NYU Social Media and Political Participation Laboratory and a co-author of the award-winning politics and policy blog at the Monkey Cage at the Washington Post, which was also co-founded by uh, one of our earlier Blogs and Bullets co-authors, John Sides, who's at GW, and the co-editor of the Journal of Experimental and Political Science. In 2006, he became the first scholar of post-communist politics to be awarded the Emerging Scholar Award for the top scholar in the field of elections, public opinion, and voting behavior within 10 years of a doctorate. And in 2012, he's part of an interdisciplinary four-person team of NYU faculty to win one of the National Science Foundation's inaugural Inspire grants. And he has phenomenal data. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, Sean. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be back here, and I'm, I'm honored to be invited, and uh, very happy to have the opportunity to address all of you uh, today. So. Uh, two things. The first is, I, Mark had said I was going to talk about Ukraine. I actually spoke about Ukraine when I was here last time at the Blogs and Bullets 4 conference. I'm going to talk about something a little bit different today. Um, and the sort of title of the talk is going to be Caution is in Order, Social Media and Regime Response. Although I am uh, regretting after the first panel that I didn't bring my comparative attacks on cheese talk to give today, um, <laughs> seeing how well that would follow. But I think you will follow, find actually that it follows very well um, from a number of the themes that were picked up in the earlier panels today. Uh, and in particular, many of the things that were just said in the last uh, discussion of the keynote wanting to be addressed will go here. So a word of caution, right? I want to zero in. We were asked to sort of respond to the Blogs and Bullet report, right? And this line jumped out at me. All told, these findings cast serious doubt on early assumptions of a more idealized socially mediated public sphere imagined by many scholars and analysts dating back to our first report following the Green Movement protests in 2009. The big picture idea here that I think is being reiterated again and again throughout this discussion here is that there was an original moment, I'll come back to this at my very end of my remarks, when we first started seeing the emergence of social media, where there was this idea that social media was an unmitigated plus to help the little guy or the little people against the state, that this would be a, a tool par excellence for opposition movements to organize against strong and powerful states. And in a sense, it was an unmitigated win for the good guy if you want to put it in that kind of language, right? And I think what's happened since then, to echo themes that have been said previously, is that, of course, the situation is much more complicated, right? And that there are a lot of different ways in which social media plays in. This does not, to echo again remarks that have been made by a number of people here, mean that social media doesn't matter or that social media is unimportant, or even that in most countries we'll ever see a protest again that doesn't have some component of social media to it. It does mean, though, that we have to think very carefully about the ways in which social media matters. What was in the report was a sort of very compelling statement about the way that social media can have pernicious effects on the opposition, on what happens when the opposition is successful and what happens next, and how social media plays into that next phase of this sort of transitional period. Although from, you know, from looking at what happens in Egypt, one of the big things that happened in the post-communist world, we had articles saying, you know, you know is transition the right word? Right? Were these transitions to democracies? Were these other things going on? Disruptions of equilibrium, perturbations. Henry Hale at George Washington has sort of most famously argued about these kind of cyclical natures of what he calls patronalistic regimes. What I want to talk today is about, actually, that picks up very nicely on themes that were raised by uh, in the preceding panel and then on other panelists, about work we've been doing in the NYU uh, Social Media and Political Participation, or SMAP Lab that looks at this other threat from social media, right? It's not just that social media empowers opposition movements, it's that regimes become aware of social media. And this is a thread that has gone through everything that is said here. And I think this is an incredibly important research agenda moving forward, which is, how does everybody use social media? How does ISIS use social media? How does pro-democracy protesters use, uh, use social media? But how do regimes react to uh, online opposition? 
and also how do regimes use social media themselves. So I'm going to talk to you about two research projects. One, I'm going to spend most of the time on one, but then we'll show you a couple things at the end from Russia and Venezuela that talk about regimes and social media in the face, in the Russian case, in face of online opposition and opposition generally, in a Venezuelan case, in a much more targeted instance of how the Venezuelan regime responded on social media to protest. All right, so this is this famous building that was identified in the New York Times uh, recently about the Russian troll factory up in St. Petersburg, to which the government then responded, no, we have nothing to do with them 18 times from 18 different Twitter accounts in identical <laughs> formats immediately. <laughs> All right, so, um, so what we want to do is we want to understand how regimes respond to online threats. And there are obviously many studies out there of, on, of government online activities. But there are few frameworks to study government responses comprehensively. Right? The one thing we kind of have is we have uh, the sort of Morozov response to liberation technologies. Liberation technology, I think, is the sort of Larry Diamond-esque, uh, you know, the ultimate view of the sort of optimistic potential of social media to empower citizens, which, again, we're not denying. We do lots of research in our lab on exactly how this happens. I've presented some of that research in this room here previously. Um, but that was the sort of up thing. And Morozov had this response about sort of breaking it down into technological versus sociopolitical responses. We're going to offer a sort of more uh, broad-based framework than that. And we're going to try to, and hopefully, it's a framework that lots of you can use, both those of you who are in academia or who are doing more, sort of more research based, but those of you who are in the policy world and just looking for frameworks to make sense of what's going on in the different types of responses of government. So we're going to what I'm going to do right here is briefly go through this. But we have a paper. It's up on, uh, it's up on this map website. If it's not, just email me. I'll send it to you. I'll make sure it's up on the SMAP website, which has all of these things. And that's just smap.nyu.edu. Um, but we're going to present a fr I'm going to present to you a framework uh, that was uh, designed to sort of encompass all of this. Uh, and then we're going to present some case study material on Russia from Putin to Putin, internet policy and perspective, and then online engagement. Uh, some, I'm going to show you some actual quantitative work that we're doing to try to use this framework to sort of illustrate what's been going on in terms of government response. So at the end of this part, I'll show you some quantitative work we're doing with bot detection and then what we've been able to come up with than what we've been able to do. Um, I neglected to say, by the way, in my first, in the opening slide when it was up here, everything that we do in this MAP lab is a huge collaborative effort. It's done with the support of the National Science Foundation and, and our Dean's Research Investment Fund. Um, and the work that I'm presenting here in particular is co-authored with this long list of co-authors here. The Russia work has been under the direction of Sergei Sonovich and Denis Dukal, two amazing PhD students in the lab. And the Venezuela work has been a project by Kevin Munger, another PhD student in the lab. Um, and in particular, the stuff I'm going to start with, uh, the framework here and the um and the Russia case study have been, you know, Yeoman's work by Sergei Sanovich. All right, so the government response online, what are, we, what are ways we can think about this? We want to try to think of this sort of from the user's experience. So this is one way. Is it an outcome observed online? Or is it a sort of point of interaction with the state? So we want to think of this in terms of like how the user is experiencing the state's uh, response. We think that one way to break this down is to think about government's goals in terms of government may be interested in structuring the media environment, government may be interested in re regulating access to media, and government may be interested in actively trying to shape engagement, shape opinions online, using online tools. So if you think about this, we can think about a government online response menu to opposition and to online opposition in terms of sort of three major categories. We can think about an offline response. This is something that happens without, and I'm going to expand on all these in a second, something that happens not in the realm of internet or the online world. We can think about online infrastructure, right? Or we can think about online engagement. So let me expand upon these, right? What can be done offline? Well, offline, you have a wide variety of outputs, a wide variety of options, right? You can, for example, try to take media out of an unregulated sphere into a regulated sphere by changing the legal regulatory environment, right? So that's a sort of big picture thing that can be done within the legal sphere. You have governments that try to influence ISPs by asking them to take down particular Facebook pages, take down particular web pages. You can have an active engagement, right, in the removal of content. You can have the national of internet platforms, right? You can actually take internet platforms and take them out of the hands of private owners and move them into the home of public owners. And you can institute legal action against particular users. And in extreme form, you can institute physical violence against particular users, right? So there's a range of things that can be done offline 
to try to change what's going on online, which ranges from infecting the entire overall structure, and there's lots of legal tools in this that the governments have in their disposal to do this, to things that involve targeting individual posts, targeting individual users, which can be done within a legal framework or within an extra legal framework. Now, you can also try to affect what's going on, the governments can try to affect what's going on online by targeting infrastructure. And indeed, this is a lot of what we think about when we tend to think of governments responding to online threats, right? So you can have things like filtering or blocking segments of the internet, most famously North Korea, taking you know huge chunks of the internet off. You talk about the Great Firewall of China. You can talk about Russia's internet blacklist. You can also do things that are uh, like, that involve tools online, right, that are, de that are intended to sort of break down infrastructure, restrict access, things like de denial of service attacks in particular cases, right? On the other hand, though, you can also try to engage online. In term, instead of restricting what people have access to online, you can try to, regimes can try to join the conversation, right? And here's Medvedev famously doing his first tweet. Um, and when he's saying, you know, hello everybody, I'm here at Twitter and this is my first tweet, right? So he's at Twitter tweeting, Medvedev comes in and he's actively engaging. This is not restricting access to Twitter in Russia. This is not taking down tw the internet in Russia. This is Medvedev getting on Twitter with his own Twitter account. So there's all sorts of different things you can do in terms of online engagement, right? You can have sort of hacker attacks online, which try to break into accounts and break into private co uh, uh, communications. You can also have, in addition to great firewalls that keep out content, you can have targeted censorship. And Alex was mentioning before the very, very uh, famous and incredible piece, if you haven't read it, by uh, Gary King and um, Jen Pan and Molly Roberts about censorship in China. Um, you can also, build automated machines that will provide online content. And these are known as bots. Um, and bots can do a whole lot of different things. They can provide propaganda and counter-propaganda, right? They can try to distort rankings. They can try to change what's trending. When you log on to a site like Yandex, which has news on it, bots can build up the popularity. Famously, we know politicians can buy bots to have supporters, so they are reported as having more supporters. Um, you can also create what people have referred to as these kind of virtual lynch mobs, where when you post something, and I know this when I write about Russia, occasionally I post something and I get sent back a whole bunch of YouTube videos showing me atrocities that are being committed by Ukrainian nationalists, right? And you know this is gonna come when certain things trigger these things, right? So. You have bots, which are computer programs that provide content. And then you also have human beings that can provide pro-government content. And I think we have to be very careful to be uh, thoughtful about who these human beings are, right? It can be very easy to be within a prism of thinking of this as, in country X, there's a regime that nobody likes, therefore anybody who is online doing this is a paid troll. No, some of the people are gonna be genuine pro-government users who like the government and can see this as their patriotic duty to make sure that Western academics, when they write op-eds in Eastern, you know, in English language pieces, know how silly their ideas are, right? And that this is a good way of protecting uh, the, the fatherland or the motherland or whatever land it is, right? So some of these people are gonna be genuine pro-government users. Some of these are people who are, who are positively inclined to support the regime, but are mobilized by the regime as well, right? Maybe through youth movements, maybe through, you know, other types of things like that. Then, of course, there are people who can be paid to provide pro-government content, and we can think of this as a, as it can be a hyper-organized process, like these kind of troll factories, and it can also be a kind of decentralized factories. Very famously, these Chinese 50 centers, or in Russia, they're called the 11 rublers, where you get paid for doing this kind of pro-government content. So this is a sort of wide-ranging span, and this is a menu of items that regimes and can choose from. And I think this is a very useful framework for as we kind of move forward and want to understand government regimes, this kind of framework, offline, online restriction, online engagement, I think can be very useful for providing us ways to think about the tools at the disposal of regimes to deal with online opposition, to deal with opposition generally, but also to think about hypotheses that we can generate about when particular strategies will be employed. There are pros and cons of different strategies, right? Shutting down the internet 
as was said before, illust you know, annoys the couch potatoes to no extent, right? It causes problems for business. There are all sorts of different things that have different advantages and disadvantages for, for different strategies. So I think as scholars or as analysts, this framework is a helpful way to be able to begin to cut into what's going on rather than just going beyond the next deal. The first step was saying social media not only helping opposition. We know that the regimes can do stuff with it. This is a second step to understand what regimes do, why they do it, and when they may do it. So just to give you a sort of very brief example of this. So uh, in the paper that we have uh, at the SMAP lab, that, uh, you know, Sergey's gone through and done this very nice detailed case study of Russia's strategy. So in the Putin one, and you notice the talk, it was called From Putin to Putin, right? So the Putin one, this is Putin before Medvedev, you had sort of diverging strategies where you had traditional media under increasingly tight control. Online media was virtually free, which was somewhat costless in the earlier days in Russia because so few people were online. But you've had a slow rise but dramatic rise of the internet in Russia. Um, under Medvedev, you saw offline on the offline and online infrastructure, you saw rare repression against individual bloggers, occasional targeting of online infrastructure, but you saw the growth of online engagement, right? You had an emergence of a pro-government blogosphere. You had the government engaging, as with Medvedev at Twitter headquarters, and you had sort of credible pro-government bloggers. And there was sort of this idea of genuine competition among the ruling, uh, ruling, the ruling coalition that was in part played out in some of these online fora. When you have Putin 2012, you have, with offline and online infrastructure, you can now look at this and you see the rise of all these sort of legal restrictions in combinations with economic tools. There's a lot going on to deal with online opposition that does not involve going into and posting things online yourself, but has to deal with altering the legal infrastructure in which this takes place, and then the rise of systemic filtering after Crimea. But you also still have, also simultaneously, a lot of online engagement, but the online engagement begins to take more of the form, and there was a great workshop that Bob Ortung, who was here earlier, held at George Washington last spring. You see this kind of TV, you know, high, slick TV-style propaganda. That's a whole other discussion here. But you also see this engaging of trolling and the trolls from the opening thing, and then you see these bots. All right. So we're gonna, we wanted to, I'll just share a little bit of our research here. So we're trying to lay out this framework so we can then make interesting hypotheses about different types of government responses. So we wanna try to find bots, right? So I wanna talk to you very briefly about our, our attempts to do this here. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the challenge of finding bots. I'll tell you about the data we used. I'll tell you about the techniques we use. I'll tell you how, it's a bit about how we did, and we actually did pretty well in finding a lot of these Russian bots. And I'll tell you some stuff that we learned about the bots, which is very preliminary, but also kind of interesting. I'll tell you a little bit about political or orientation of bots in the Russian bot sphere, and I'll tell you a little bit about coordinated activity. You're gonna do that in five minutes, right? I'm gonna do that in five minutes, yep. <laughs> All right, hey, you guys told me to talk longer. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> All right. cool. All right, so bots are Twitter accounts uh, 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 operated by automated programs instead of humans. I just talked about this. So the way that computer scientists try to find bots is they take a training data set of bot activity and then they use that to build machine learning models that can identify these bots, and then they go to new data and see how well it goes finding it. The problem is, there is no training data set of political bots, and we don't know if they're different from other types of bots. Moreover, even with all the work that's been done so far, there were estimates that up to 80% of bots are undetectable. All right, so we think political bots may have different purposes from spam bots that are basically trying to take you to go visit particular websites that sell various and sundry things. So here's what we went about doing. We built a big collection of Russia of data from the Russia Twitter sphere that had to do with Russian politics. So we have a very large collection. The part I'm going to show you about today is about 18 million tweets from 3.8 million different Twitter accounts over essentially a eight month, a 10 month period, a very eventful 10 month period in Russia from February 6th to November 5th, 2014. Set up a bunch of keywords related to politics. Collected a ton of tweets. Here's a bunch of statistics on it. I won't go through this because I'm uh, because it's running a short on time. What we did then was combine computer science methods with what the computer scientists call domain-specific uh, knowledge, which we would call sort of regional expertise. And what we did was we looked at a number of different computer science methods. One was looking at the timing between tweets, how often accounts were tweeting. One was looking at the followers to friends ratio. So there are some bots that follow tons and tons of people, but nobody follows them. There are other bots where, that don't follow anybody that may just be out there spamming. So we looked at both of these types of accounts. 
And then we did something else where we used, um, we looked for identical tweets in our data set. So bots are not, cre not that creative, <laughs> or generation one bots are not that creative. So we looked for identical tweets. All right, then what we did was after we identified these suspicious accounts based on these computer science metrics, we actually went and looked at all of them to see if they looked like bots. And we used verification of suspicious accounts and we used sentiment analysis to understand whether they were, what sort of political orientation these bots had. Again, this was a very first step, so this is a labor intensive process. Okay, so the sort of flow of this, just to show you what we did, we collected the tweets, this got us a set of candidate bots, we use expert verification, we refined the set of bots, then the bots that we had we classified and we grouped the bots in terms of sentiment, then we ran some statistical analysis on it. So finding bots that we did, we have the different, rate, the different methods that we use to find the bots, and what you'll see is that these methods were very effective in locating bots. Our CS methods showed really good performance and we found 570 accounts that we confirmed to be bots. Um, now, here's where things got really interesting. The first thing we found is that an awful lot of these bots, what they are doing, and this ties very well back into what was going on beginning here, they are just spitting out news feeds. So these are bots that may be for media companies, they may be for political purposes, but all they do is headlines, and Mark and I know this from the monkey cage, you post something on the monkey cage and all of a sudden seven bots will just repeat it straight up. So this, there is a lot of this going on here and all of these methods are prevalent in these news feed bots. The interesting thing though, when we found bots that weren't news feeds, is that they were actually very evenly split between being pro-Kremlin, pro-opposition, and pro-Ukrainian. Now this is just the tip of the iceberg. We only could look at a certain number of things. These were our highest candidates for being bots. But we did actually find in our set, the ones that we could identify, and again, we did this all data-driven, that the anti-Kremlin bots were twice as numerous as the pro-Kremlin bots, and that the political bots were non-primitive. They didn't just repeat tweets. They were actually generating content. Um, so we classification, we do things, I'll skip this for now. The other thing that we could do is we could then take our bots that were from the different orientations, so the pro-Kremlin bots, the pro-opposition bots, and the pro-Ukrainian bots, and we could look at the kinds that we found through these sort of different types of methods. So the ones that we found from entropy versus the ones we found from ratios. Here's the key takeaway, and then we can track how active these bots were. So this is the really exciting thing, because if you have theories about how and when you think governments are responding, and you can identify the pro-government bots, you can see their activity, you can test whether or not you understand how they're responding. So this is where the huge payoff has the potential to come from. Some very preliminary analysis of this, right? The pro-Kremlin bots, two different types of pro-Kremlin bots showed a high degree of correlation in their tweeting. The pro-Ukrainian bots also showed a high degree of correlation. The opposition, and this is not gonna come as a surprise to anybody in Russian politics, showed less coordination. Right, so this suggests, so we're less, sorry, just we're less correlated. What this suggests to us is that there seems to be some forensic evidence that both the government and the pro-Ukrainian forces were sort of more coordinated in what they were doing when they were ramping up bots and when they were trying to use them than the opposition, which seemed a little bit more haphazard in what was going on. Again, small numbers. We know we're missing tons and tons of bots. We, these were things we had to look at by hand, but very promising for future research. Okay. Um, so that's the takeaways. I got two more minutes? Sure. Okay, so two more minutes. Let me show you one other thing. So here's another thing about social media. That was a sort of very big picture thing about opposition regimes responding. Let me show you a very, very focused thing, right? So in 2014, there were these Venezuelan anti-Maduro protests. What we did during these protests is we collected every tweet by every member of parliament who had a Twitter account in Venezuela. Twitter is hugely popular in Venezuela. So this got us most of the members of parliament. And we had regime members and opposition members of parliament. We do a lot of interesting things with this data. There's lots of stuff in the paper. It's on the, it's on the website. You should check it out. I also can send you an updated version of it. Um, but we used a method called unsupervised topic modeling, right, which is this LDA analysis for those of you in the room who are familiar with this. But we let, essentially, we looked at all the tweets by the members of the opposition and all the tweets by the members, the pro-government deputies. And in each day, we looked at sort of all the words that were contained in all these tweets and used machine learning methods to estimate how many topics they were talking about, to estimate how these tweets went across different topics. And then we used something from biology called a Shannon entropy measure, which shows how much, when you have lots of different options for something, something that could fire 
fire on 100 different levels, how much coordination is there in the actual pattern of this? So what it shows you from a political science perspective, which is super interesting, and this is kind of the fun stuff about being in an interdisciplinary lab, is that this is actually a really nice measure to test something that we have theories about in political science, which is how on target people are on messages, right? And so, and again, this is very dispersed. We're looking at, you know, 100 regime of Twitter accounts here. But the theory is that during a period of protest, the opposition should be trying to zoom in everyone's focus on this protest, and the government should be trying to distract people and talk about lots of different things. And we test this in a bunch of different ways in the paper, but just to show you really quickly, this is a measure of day by day, the dotted line is the opposition, and the, and the straight line, sorry, the dotted line is the regime and the straight line is the opposition. What we found was when we looked at variation across these different topics, and again, this is totally dispersed, this is not a single person, is that once the protests start, in, before the protest, you see similarities between the government and the regime and how dispersed they are. Once the protests start, the regime tweets become on larger numbers of topics. They're more spread across lots of different topics. The opposition stays really, really tightly focused, and then this is when the protests get resolved, and then things go back to normal, and then it stops, right? So again, this is, a, this is an extreme digital forensic technique, and I think it's, it's such a sort of kind of deep learning type you know, layer of things here that I'm not even saying that this is something that is a, that we're, we're not even saying that this is something we're claiming that we, you know, this is not one account. We're not measuring what the president was saying. But it is extremely interesting, right, that the regime responded in a way that we would expect regimes to respond, and indeed we have formal models of, of this sorts of thing that suggest this, by trying to expand the information environment. And how did it do this? It did this by people talking on social media, right? So just the same way that the opposition may have been using social media exactly as we think it is to drum up attention to this and repeatedly focusing on this, the regime was trying to divert attention, but one of the tools it used to do this was Twitter. All right, so the conclusion is, Social media is a double-edged sword, right? I do not want to, and I started with this, I'm gonna end with this, I do not want to deny the sort of awesome power of social media in a protest context. I think the remarks that were made last time are absolutely true. I think all protests now are going to have social media components to them in countries where the technology permits, which is most of the world at this point. It's enormously important, it's enormously important that we understand how social media affects the dynamics of protests in all the different myriads of ways we've been talking about so far. Nor should we deny the ability of social media to connect citizens, especially in countries where it was harder for citizens to talk to one another about politics, and for citizens to bring pressure on the state, to use social media to bring pressure on the state. But we need to recognize that the state, too, is aware of the power of social media, right? And I want to leave you with a thought, right? And this is the thing that I've talked to a lot about people and people in this room about before, but like, did we have a moment, right, where liberation technology was correct that social media became an awesome power in the hands of people who are opposed to more authoritarian regimes because, precisely because the nature of authoritarian regimes is to be surrounded by yes people who want to tell the leader that everything's fine, who want to downplay potential threats to the regime. And there was a brief period of time where people surrounding autocrats did not recognize the power of social media to fuel opposition movements, but we're now past that period of time. And we're now much more into, as Marosa suggested, this kind of cat and mouse game where you have oppositions trying to figure out how to use social media, but you have regimes very well aware of this with a wide repertoire of tools at their disposal that they are beginning to figure out how to use. And we, as scholars, analysts, policy advisors, need to be able to understand how they're using these tools as well. And I think this is an important agenda moving forward. So thanks for your time. As much as you want. <laughs> Uh, let me introduce you. Okay, uh, thanks, that was terrific. Um, Adrian Labat, as Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Government at AU here in town. Um, she's uh, She joined the Department of Government in the fall of 2009. Prior to that, she was Prize Research Fellow at Newfield College, University of Oxford, and Assistant Professor of Political Science and African Studies at Michigan State. Her research interests include social movements, democratization, and political violence, and she's the author of From Protest to Parties, Party Building and a Democratization in Africa, which was named Best Book by the African Politics Conference Group. Yeah. You? Oh, and I'm at the Wilson Center this year. Oh, and you're at the Wilson Center yeah. this year. Yeah. <laughs> Plug for the Wilson Center. Yes, exactly.
Thanks. Yes. Uh, so this is going to be something very, very different. And so first of all, I want to thank uh, Mark and the rest of his team for inviting me to come and speak today. It's been quite a while since I've checked in on the social media literature. I'm not a social media scholar myself. And it's really been amazing to see both the methodological and also just the, the, the revolution in terms of the data and the ways in which they're using data. So it's, it's been really great seeing that. I am going to give a very different presentation. I don't have data to tell you about. Instead, this is going to be really a macro lens and how I think this stuff works out on the African continent. So when Mark initially gave me the invitation to come today, he did, uh, you know, I told him what I was going to talk about, and Burkina Faso was going to be part of that. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, for those of you who have been following the news in the past week and a half, Burkina Faso has gone through another kind of moment of mass mobilization and really dramatic events, and so I am going to talk about Burkina. But first, I, I want to give an overview of what social media looks like on the continent. And one of the things I want to preface this talk with is just suggesting that generally, when we look at Sub-Saharan Africa, when we're looking at this sort of methodological and data revolution on examining social media, I do think that Africa has been slightly left out of that. And so we don't have a lot of Africanist scholars who are looking at this topic. And I think that part of that is just it hasn't gotten there yet. And part of it is also about the degree of internet penetration on the continent. Uh, in terms of protest mobilization, I am going to talk about Burkina. And so obviously, protest mobilization, the use of social media is going to be part of that. But because the, this report that was just recently released focuses on sort of democratic consolidation, transitional moments, I do want to talk a little bit about that as well. So like most of the people who've been working on Egypt and uh, the rest of the Arab Spring, I'm very skeptical about the ability of social me media to assist in protest coordination. Certainly we haven't seen a lot of evidence of that in sub-Saharan Africa. But I think I am a little bit more optimistic possibly than the, the blogs and bullets team on the ability of different electronic platforms to assist assist in the development of accountability and democratization. And so at the end of the, of the talk, I do want to suggest a couple of electronic platforms, not social media, but electronic platforms we've seen having that sort of beneficial role uh, on the African continent. So to start off, uh, in terms of overview, uh, just to give you the, the broad sense of how social media looks on the continent, we do have limited internet penetration. And so in some respects, it is like, more like the Middle East than like Eastern Europe and, or other places in terms of internet penetration, even lower than in North Africa and the Middle East. So uh, data from the UN suggests that about 15.3% of the population has access to the internet in Africa. I should suggest that internet access looks very different different than in other parts of the world. So we're mostly talking about public spaces, internet cafes. We're also talking about very sporadic internet access. Now, the one sort of bright point and the one place where this may change very, very rapidly is we have very, very high rates of cell phone usage on the continent. And so Sub-Saharan Africa had that kind of technological leapfrog. They moved from having almost no access to landlines to having incredibly high cell phone penetration. So the rates that we have is, when we look at the continent as a whole, um, well over 50% of households own a cell phone. Uh, if we look at um, sort of the more uh, populous countries, then those cell phone usage uh, rates move to about 80 percent of urban households and over 60 percent of rural households. In places like Ghana, Kenya, and Tanzania that are also the most active Twitter users on the continent, more than 80 percent of adults have use of a cell phone. And so there's a very high um, level of penetration using cell phones. And I'm going to talk a little bit about text messages and how those have often played an alternative role to social media. Uh, now, as smartphones sort of move up, then, you know, I think that we could see greater use of data, greater use of social media by a much more expansive group of users in sub-Saharan Africa. I should note that that's increasing very, very rapidly from very low rates. So right now in Nigeria, we can talk about 25 percent of cell phone users having access to smartphones. And I've really seen an explosion over the past year, year and a half in terms of smartphone users. 
Now, our cell phones, great. Uh, I, I think that actually the existing research on cell phone coverage in, uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa sort of does suggest some evidence for the kind of pernicious effects of social media or greater connectivity uh, sort of thesis that's being put forward by the, by the Peace Lab folks. So uh, there has been a little bit of research being done on uh, tracking violent events and finding some association from places that have the greatest cell phone penetration with greater numbers or clustering of violent offense, events in those areas. And so Jan Perskella and uh, uh, Cullen Camber Warren, uh, both of those people do have research that's published on this. And so we're at the very beginning here and looking at these kinds of things. In terms of social media in particular, I want to echo something, sort of concerns that both Sahar and, and Alex raised in their earlier comments about how thin this group of users may be. And so certainly there is a heavily urban component to social media presence in sub-Saharan Africa. And also, I think very small numbers of people are using these social media platforms. A lot of the people who are using them tend to be connected to uh, the international community. And many of them tend to be expats who are actually away from their home countries. And so I think one of the real questions that I would like to raise about the use of social media in Africa is, is it really only serving this kind of bridging role that Mark mentioned, where it's really about connection and about uh, communication with broader international audiences or transnational audiences. And I, I think that, that that may be true. Uh, the other kind of caveat I do want to make is, unlike many other regions in the world, people are not tweeting in their mother tongues. So uh, the vast majority of Twitter activity on the continent is in English and French, and there's a big uh, drop off, and in terms of sub-Saharan Africa, we have a small um, amount being uh, tweeted in Arabic and a small amount being uh, tweeted in Swahili. None of those are, the vast majority of Africans, those are not their first languages. Those are really sort of um, languages that are used as, as, as general means of communication. So certainly when we're talking about polarization, emotion, any of these kinds of things, you know, there, there may be a mediating role played here by the language, but then secondly, this does make that kind of performance or that kind of connection with the international audience much more um, central to the sort of Twitter activity. Now, in terms of the way that Twitter is actually used, so we haven't seen the explosion of uh, sort of academic research on Twitter, nor the explosion of interest in Twitter. The one exception that is Burkina Faso, which uh, foreign policy, I think, uh, ran back in 2014 when we had the first mass uprising in, in Burkina Faso. They ran a piece saying, has the Arab Spring finally come to Africa? I've also seen Burkina Faso referred to as Africa's first Twitter revolution. So certainly that is seen as an exceptional case and a case where there was very high levels of Twitter engagement. Now, can we map that on to internet penetration? Just this week, we also had another major crisis in Central African Republic. So I went and looked at the UN data on internet penetration in those two countries. We have 4.4% of the Burkinabe population has access to the internet. Uh, in Central African Republic, it's 3.5%. And so, you know, these are very, very small communities. Yet if you look at the Twitter feed, massive differences between these two countries. So I think internet penetration is not the entire story. Instead, a lot of this is about these platforms becoming something that is used that then has this sort of self-perpetuating quality. So let me tell you a little bit about Burkina Faso and how Twitter uh, sort of played out during two different protest events in uh, Burkina Faso over the past year. So the first is October 2014, and you essentially had in October the beginning of several street protests organized by uh, Belay Citoyen, which is like a citizen's broom, which is a grassroots political movement that does have a Twitter presence, but not really that into Twitter. Twitter themselves, uh, so they don't tweet a lot, although they do have a Twitter presence. And they organize these demonstrations against the rule of uh, President Blaise uh, Kampore, who has ruled Burkina Faso for 27 years since a military coup against Thomas Sankara. And, uh, 
the trigger for this or the event that, that created this protest movement was the third term issue. And so Campori was seeking a constitutional amendment in order to allow him to run for a third term. There was widespread popular disagreement with this move, and so that was the beginning of the protests. Protests grew very, very quickly, and essentially the, the regime was overthrown in basically two days at the end of October. And so you had hundreds of thousands of people out on the street, possibly even a million on uh, October 30th, and all of this was tweeted. And so there was a hashtag Louis V, which was used by activists, used by journalists, used by expats. And so there is an enormous amount of Twitter data there waiting for people to mine, if you have any interest. Um, but I think, you know, when we're looking at how that played out, a lot of it did sort of display these qualities of bridging. So now fast forward to today, uh, this past week. So again, uh, we, we have a sort of moment where Burkina Faso again enters into Twitter as a trending topic and becomes, uh, this becomes one of the uh, tools that activists and others are using to communicate about events on the ground. And essentially what triggered this this time was on September 16th, there was a coup by the Presidential Guard, the RSP, in uh, Burkina Faso. This is an elite separate military unit that actually was trained by the United States in counter-terror and it is is one of the elite counterterrorism units in West Africa. It also is very closely aligned with former President Blaise Compore, who was overthrown and forced into exile. And uh, the trigger for this coup that occurred on the 16th was a uh, commission established by the interim government had issued a report suggesting the dissolution of the RSP and suggesting that the RSP, this presidential guard, was an obstacle to democracy in uh, Burkina Faso. Also, the interim government had barred several, not all, of the former ruling party MPs, but barred several ruling party MPs from contesting the elections that were to occur this coming month. So those two events together provoked this coup from the presidential guard. Now, what happened ne next was really very quite dramatic, and it did play out on Twitter, and all of us were really glued to our Twitter feeds, and there were certainly photographs and videos and all the you would expect from Twitter revolutions of this kind. So uh, the populace resisted this, went out into the street in a large, uh, large numbers, and you then had the military side with protesters. They marched on Ouagadougou in order to overthrow this, uh, this coup government led by this elite presidential guard. Where we are right now is essentially the coup, coup failed, but that presidential guard today is refusing to disarm. And so we're not out of the woods yet in Burkina, but the, the basic story here is one in which popular protest overthrew an entrenched authoritarian regime and then overthrew a coup that was um, int intended to sort of restore that regime. And so this is a really amazing story. Now, how central was Twitter to all of this? If you look at this protest, and if you look at protests across the continent, so you know I am a scholar of protests, my first book was, was about social movements and how they organize, what you find is that these kinds of activists who have access to social media, certainly in terms of organization of protests, very, very marginal. Instead, protests are organized by grassroots uh, organizations, some informal, some formal. So in Burkina Faso, it was Belay Citoyen, as I mentioned. It was also very powerful trade unions movement. And those are the organizations that got people out on the street. In the small amount of academic literature we have on individual participation in both protests and riots, most data suggests that face-to-face -face recruitment is what motivates people out into the street. And so there's really no suggestion or no evidence suggesting that people people were following Twitter and deciding to leave their houses at that point in time. So, I, you know, I think that generally, uh, even though it was a very dramatic kind of Twitter experience for those of us who were involved in it, it did more have the quality of this sort of news aggregation or bridging use of social media rather than anything that had to do with protest coordination or about the communication of people's experiences of these protests. So does that mean that there's no electronic media? or no real role for electronic platforms in terms of transitions in Africa? No, not at all. As I mentioned, 
there is the use of cell phones. And so I, I do want to give you um, some sense of how this works. So, uh, you know, I can give you one anecdote from uh, my time in Zimbabwe in 2002, 2003, which um, was a very polarized uh, period in Zimbabwean politics. And this was actually a time when text messages cost a lot more money than they do now. And certainly during mass stayaways that were organized by the opposition, we were receiving text messages all day long that were for from one group to another. And sometimes the, these had the quality of rumors, sometimes these were official communications from the opposition party or from the trade unions. And so there is this use of text messages. I've seen very little work, academic work on this, very little policy work on text messages, no kinds of data on text message volume. And I think that that would maybe be an area in which it would be really interesting to look at this and would be a way of connecting Sub-Saharan Africa to the kinds of debate and research that are occurring in other regions. The only scholar I've seen who've really looked at these issues of polarization, hardening, and the things that, that uh, Mark mentioned in his talk was an anthropologist who works in slums in Nairobi who has an excellent piece in the Journal of East African uh, Studies on the use of text messages during the post-election crisis in Kenya in 2007, 2008. And she found that, yes, there was this kind of circulation of rumors, circulation of hate speech, all of the rest. Now, again, we should be very skeptical about how far these text messages reach, and certainly they reach much farther in urban environments. When I was in Kenya during the constitutional referendum in 2010, I was out in the Rift Valley, which is one of the real epicenters of violence in Kenya, and uh, what I found there is no use of social media, no use of text messages. Instead, hate speech, rumors, all of these things, they were being distributed by anonymous leaflet. And so we are still seeing the same kind of use of technology here, the photocopier, but uh, it's, it's working out in a very different um, way. And I think what was really interesting is very little of that was repeated on Kenyan social media, again suggesting that much of the Twitter presence, much of the social media presence um, on the continent is still directed towards foreign and international audiences. Um, I should say on that, just because it's directed at foreign and international audiences, it doesn't mean that it doesn't endanger regimes and doesn't force regime response. And so certainly this is one of the things that African governments are very concerned about. Uh, I really found Josh's talk fascinating. I was thinking through sort of what I knew of um, various government responses. Certainly we do have governments that try to shut down Twitter, do regulate internet access. They generally don't have the capacity capacity to do it very well. Uh, so when I was living in Zimbabwe, there was constant talk about monitoring of email, and we all knew that there wasn't the technical capacity to do anything in Zimbabwe about internet connectivity. Um, but I, you know, I think that this is an emerging frontier, and so certainly as a sort of very marginal Twitter user, uh, the one government that does leap out as, as possibly having a social media uh, strategy in the same way that the Russian government does is uh, the government of Rwanda. Uh, it has very, very active Twitter presence. It has shell accounts that it uses, and it really does try to shift the debate um, about the country on Twitter. And so even though you know, there's not this mass quality to Twitter, this doesn't mean that governments aren't responding to it, and it doesn't have any ability to threaten or to uh, provoke regime action. So uh, let me just use my last three to five minutes to talk about two other electronic platforms that I think may be very different in Sub-Saharan Africa and may be sort of a, a beneficial use of electronic media and technology for deepening democracy on the continent. So the first of these is about the use of cell phones and the use of electronic platforms to basically document and to keep governments honest. So I want to tell you about the use of a parallel vote tabulation in Zimbabwe in 2008. And then the second is the explosion of crowdsource data on the continent, and particularly crowdsource data about services delivery, which I think, you know, even though it's at a very early stage and we certainly haven't seen any kind of fulfillment of this promise, it does possibly have the ability to uh, create constituencies for reform and for greater accountability and possibly bring together more disparate coalitions than we've seen in the opposition um, in the past. 
So first of all, Zimbabwe and the parallel vote tabulation. So March 2008 was a harmonized parliamentary and presidential election in Zimbabwe. For those of you who don't follow Zimbabwe, you basically have an entrenched authoritarian ruling party and a very, very strong opposition movement that emerged out of the trade unions and was organized primarily through these kinds of organizational mobilizing structures. So. The March 2008 uh, election was the third contest between Mugabe and Morgan Changarai, and it was a very, very close election. South African President Thabo Mbeki had been able to obtain a concession from the ruling party in Zimbabwe during the run-up to the elections that they would post all of the polling station results on the doors outside polling stations. The MDC, the opposition party, saw this as an opportunity to use their vast network of supporters. They couldn't get their party activists into areas of, into rural areas in Zimbabwe because it was just too dangerous, very violent. And so they mobilized their vast network of supporters and said, you use your cell phones to take pictures of the polling station results and text them to us. And they were able, through this process, to actually compile this parallel vote tabulation, which was not accepted by the government, and so it's not a total victory, but it did keep the government from stealing the election. And so there was a, a parallel vote tabulation results were posted online before the Electoral Commission actually posted. There then was a, a six weeks of silence on the regime's part where they try to figure out how to deal with this. And they didn't claim victory. Instead, they said, well, the parallel vote tabulation doesn't take into account all of these uh, spoiled ballots and all the rest, and so uh, the opposition leader, Morgan Changare, doesn't have the 50 percent that would allow him to avoid a second round presidential election. So it went to a second round. There was massive, massive violence, and Mugabe retained control. So it's not a completely wonderful, happy story, but it is certainly a story about the use by ordinary citizens of technology in order to increase the integrity of elections, and I think that that's something that is one potential beneficial use. And then I'll close with the second, which is this uh, story about crowd crowdsource data. The example of this, and this is really the example that's being used for crowdsource data and human rights documentation all over the world, is a Kenyan organization called Ushahidi, which was formed in uh, the immediate aftermath of the 2007 elections, and it, again, used text messages in order to aggregate data. And so it provided a phone number for Kenyans to text uh, reports of violence all over the country to this central uh, phone number, and they then used used those text messages to compile maps, and so they had an online, constantly updated uh, dynamic mapping of violence events all over Kenya. And this technology has now been exported and is being used by protesters all over the world in order to map, uh, to map protests and police activity during protests as well. And so this is, you know, again, a very good use of, um, of crowdsource data, electronic platforms to improve the integrity of elections or at least to document where political violence is taking place. And in the aftermath of that, we have seen a sort of explosion of these kinds of crowdsource data applications, particularly in Kenya, but also in, in the rest of the, uh, in the rest, on the rest of the uh, continent. And so I, I work in Nairobi slums, and uh, what we've seen there is a sort of crowd or community sourced mapping of Kabir era first, and now there's a new one in Mathare, another uh, slum in Nairobi. And essentially these, again, rely on text messages from ordinary users, photos of public goods, and this allows for the mapping of these slums that had previously not been mapped at all. And as a survey researcher, I can tell you it's very, very difficult to do survey work in places that don't have any maps at all. And so now these slums are mapped. Um, they both both of these, uh, both of these programs, both um, it's Map Kabira and then Spatial Collective, they both, when you go into their web pages, they talk about how this can be used as a means of pressuring governments and a means of assembling constituencies for reform. So certainly there is a desire to use these as political platforms. We haven't seen that actually taking place, but certainly we do have better data about services delivery and about these communities now than we did. Sorry for going no, to that's over. Okay, we have Thanks. about uh, 
we have about 10 minutes for, for questions. Um, in the back, in the yellow. So I have two quick questions. Um, one is for um, our colleague from NYU. Does your platform at all use or analyze any content uh, in the deep web or dark web? And do you envision that as an opportunity for research down the road, looking at where governments are engaging using unregistered domain? My other question is with regards to Africa and the Sahel region. Do you, given the low ubiquity of digital platforms and the utility of, of cellular devices, envision a smart strategic communication approach to countering extremism in the Boko Haram uh, movement, particularly regarding recruitment of young um, soldiers, is there an approach that you would think could be more effective than what we're currently? Josh, you want to take us on that? The dark. Oh, mine. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, we haven't done anything with the deep web, dark web, uh, and I mean the. To the extent that it's engagement and altering the conversation online, we wouldn't expect people to be hiding while they're doing this. That's sort of counter the point of it. That being said, if you want to take this framework of how governments respond, there may be all sorts of things going on, including recruitment and these sorts of things and these levels. And I think going back to the discussion from earlier this morning about talking about ISIS and ISIS-based recruiting, um, there I think you have to very seriously try to figure out after initial contacts are made with people in more public fora where these conversations are taking place afterwards if you want to be able to study that process. Uh, so on the Sahel, I, you know, the Islamist groups are actually an exception to this general sort of trend. And so they have very savvy social media strategies and um, significant online presence. Now, are they directing that to recruitment indigenously or in internally? No. Um, it really is focused, again, on the international, um, the, inter the broader international uh, stage. So certainly in both Somalia and to a much lesser extent in the Sahel, you do have the recruitment of people from elsewhere, returning, uh, returning um, people who are ethnically from these places. And so you do have these returning jihadists who are coming from the United States and Britain, and certainly they've probably been recruited via social media. But uh, in terms of domestic recruitment for all of these groups, there's very little suggestion that it's being used in this way. Um, so most of the recruitment, as I said, to protest movements and to riots in the country is face-to-face -face recruitment. And um, I, I work in Nigeria, and certainly when we look at Boko Haram, that's what we see happening. It's face-to-face -face recruitment or recruitment through um, other kinds of associations that have then been co-opted, also a great deal of kidnapping. And so. Yeah, I, I think, you know, do we want to focus on, uh, you know, social media as a way of undercutting Islamist mobilization in the Sahel? No. I, I think that when we talk about transnational networks, though, it could be very, very important. And so we do have evidence that in uh, northeastern uh, Nigeria, there has been use of bomb-making technology that was imported from the Middle East and from Somalia. And so these are transnational networks, and certainly focusing on internet connectivity could be a way of disrupting the emergence of those kinds of transnational linkages. Josh, one thing we didn't get to in our report that we initially thought we would uh, was this issue of how governments respond, and we just didn't have data that addressed the question enough to do it. Um, I'm curious, though, do you think that um, governments, or let's say that, that publics or activists are more or less vulnerable in these transition periods vis-a-vis -vis government use of social media reactions, et cetera, versus protest moments? I mean, I think you have to think about this in two ways. Like, on the one hand, there's the question of sort of the overall government strategy of trying to deflect what is happening in terms of an opposition force 
that is emanating online and strategies to do that. And, cr and clearly, if you have social media, if social media is playing a role in getting people to protest, and there are protests where we think it played a huge role getting people to protest, especially if somehow media, social media is somehow pe making people feel more comfortable staying at protests or giving protests sustained staying power, as was clearly the case in Euromaidan, where Facebook was being organized to do all sorts of things, was being used to organize people doing all sorts of things, then disrupting those sort of social media networks and protest moments moments could be particularly, you know, important. On the question of whether individuals are sort of more at threat at moments of big disruptions or in the sort of quieter periods after these disruptions, I mean, I think some of the initial work you guys did with Iran is a sort of case of how the Iranian government, my understanding is, I think this is from your first report, the Iranian government afterwards, when things got quieter, were able to go back to Facebook to try to find people and see who was there. I think in the, you know, in the Russian context, certainly most of the period in the Russian context that we've been studying was not, I mean, the entire period that this data came from, but a lot of the period that people are interested in is not right in the aftermath of the original protests uh, in 2011, 2012, but it's been a sustained project to wear down the opposition in all sorts of different manners that's been in this, I mean, it's, it's not right to call it the transition period. It's not the same thing you're talking about in Egypt, but it is this post-protest period. And during those periods of time, I think, it's especially interesting to be looking at what uh, what governments are going or what governments are doing just to be totally clear i mean most of what i presented on today is by is trying to set a framework a research right. framework mm -hmm. for how we can talk about this in a way where we might be able to you know, get beyond this discussion of like, does it help the protesters? Does it not help the protesters? Does it help the regime? Does it not help the, and begin to sort of draw on research strands across different places. So in terms of what we know about what, in terms of what I personally know about the Russian government, I mean, there's, I know a lot more from having read that New York Times article than I know from what we've done. But I think what we've done shows there is promising uh, opportunities for using these kind of digital forensic techniques to marry it with social science theory about how regimes respond in these kinds of situations, both in moments of protest or in moments of transition. In the back. Your comment uh, on Will Burns, our um, when I was at Internews a couple of years ago, we sponsored research um, and worked with uh, uh, groups in both, just to take an example, both Nigeria and South Sudan. In Nigeria, and, and we actually tested uh, surveillance of networks in, in Nigeria. In fact, the government was surveilling and had contracted with outside international groups uh, to, to build surveillance uh, technologies. Um, so, and, and then as a second example, South Sudan had a, had a, had a bill in their legislature in the middle of the fratricidal civil war to allow the National Security Service to monitor uh, networks in South Sudan. So I just want to elaborate a little further that even in the context of, you know, when we talk about the platforms aren't available, technology is not available, infrastructure is not available, the governments, in fact, are, uh, are pursuing this and trying to get ahead of the curve. So just, just a comment. Yeah, and just to point Excellent. to that, I mean, like, those are not highly technical activities. Well, one of them might be, but they're not, you know, building bots and troll factories or anything like that. They're trying to change. The second one in particular is trying to change the legal infrastructure. I mean, it's in it's kind of incredible how much, like, looking at what's being done on the legal infrastructure can give you insight mm -hmm. onto what the strategy may be. Alex? Thank you. Question for Josh. Um, so I don't know if you could speak to this, but what is the intent of these bots? Uh, there, uh, is the intent just to put so much in the actual conversation that they can hope to actually alter someone's ideological position? Is it just to create noise? I mean, I th so I think that's the open question, right? Um, and I think that's why the data analytics part of this is so potentially exciting because the way we, I think the way we're going to I mean I'm thinking of this as a social scientist but like I think the way we're going to figure out what the intent is we're going to hypothesize what the intent would be we're going to come up with lists of what lots of anecdotal things that journalists have suggested that petite, particular people and then we're going to say okay if this is the intent what are the observable implications and we're going to go look at the data right so just to give an example of how that might work if the intent is much like the Venezuelan protest is to create noise in the internet anytime there's a 
a sort of potentially threatening moment, then there are specific predictions about when the activities of these bots should peak, right? If the intent is basically to hound Mike McFall mercilessly, right, like we can track that. We can see how much, you know, how much activity Mike is getting from trolls and whether the person who replaces him in an ambassador gets the same amount of things. I mean, like, I think we have to kind of go about this from a, a, um, a deductive perspective, not an inductive perspective, because just looking at what's going on. So I think we sort of look at what people's reported interactions with these things are, look at what our own personal inter interactions with these kinds of things are, begin to think about hypotheses. That being said, I think the framework that we presented uh, in the paper, which is to say, it might be used to influence rankings, right? Like that you want to push certain stories up so that they're trending, I think is a big thing. It might be used to create a sense, a general sense that the government is popular. So if every time, so I mean, I, you can see this if you sort of try to reverse engineer it. If you're the government and you see that there are on these online forum, there's constantly all this critical activity taking place and you respond by saying, what the heck, this is urban elites. This is not an accurate reflection of what the population thinks about us. We have to have a conversation that more accurately reflects that there's lots of people in the population who like what we're doing so I'm giving it a very charitable spin but you know like let's empower those people and get those people online so they can talk about it that would be to alter the tone of the conversation um, and then I think I mean uh, there is some t I mean I think part of it is you know which is a, a big thing in the blogosphere ironically outside of politics but we do see you know if you go and look at a lot of this stuff that's being written more recently about the experiences of female bloggers like particularly in the tech sector um, some of the anecdotal some of the pieces that have been written by female bloggers just about these kinds of attempts to silence voices online I think it's not hard to take that sort of a framework and transfer that into the political sphere where you know we would almost in a sense be more of expecting that to, that type of behavior thing but what's neat about this is I I think these are different goals that should have different digital footprints that as we get better at finding the digital evidence, we should be able to better, you know, kind of in that King, in the spirit of the King, Pan and Roberts thing is to sort of reverse engineer the process and then see what the real world looks like, uh, which of the processes the real world seems to look like more. But by the way, again, in the spirit of everything we've been talking about here, like, just because they're doing one of these things doesn't mean there isn't some other group of people doing another one of these things. None of this is meant to be mutually exclusive. And I think we'll, and I think it's a cat and mouse game. So, I mean, we may nail down right now, there's three really interesting things that governments are doing, right? But it may turn out that in six months, they're doing a fourth thing, which we hadn't even thought about now, that we may or may not be able to identify. And they're probably doing lots of, I mean, this is at the tip of the iceberg trying to figure this stuff out. Hey, Jim, before we close, I want to ask yeah. you one quick question then. So the, you mentioned the crowdsourcing efforts at mm -hmm. the end, which are a really interesting part of the story in places like Kenya and a few other places. Are those, are those efforts using these other platforms, do you think that those are building the kinds of sustainable communities, sub-communities that can be mobilized later? Uh, in the ways that we've seen in certain other cases where it's, it's not that Facebook brings down a dictator, it's that there are already activist organizations and infrastructure that can exploit Facebook. Do you feel like that's happening with this crowdsourcing, these crowdsourcing examples, or is it still atomized? So uh, what I like about the crowdsourcing approach is that it, it could play a role in assembling constituencies that otherwise would have been sort of split. And so one of the reasons that I've been working a lot on, on services delivery is because I think it's a way of actually transcending these kinds of identity-based cleavages that often structure show, social life in these places. So I work in cities, and in both Lagos and in, in Nairobi, you have slums that are very ethnically diverse, and they're socially segregated, um, both just in terms of space, but also just in terms of churches and all other kinds of networks. And so I think possibly by creating these kinds of platforms, you provide the community something that is entirely apart from their social lives that they can participate in together. And could that possibly create some kind of organizational capital that opposition movements could use and make use of in, in protest movements? Sure, why not? But it could also give these people a sense that there are interests that they share that have nothing to do with ethnicity, nothing to do with past political mobilization, and actually have to do with sort of concrete things that they together need. Well, in theory, if that happened, then they have a protest, and then they go into a transitional period, maybe they wouldn't 
degenerate into the sort of polarized communities that we saw. I mean, let me let me just make a last point on polarization because a lot of my la of my past work has been on polarization. Polarization generally occurs in these moments, and I think that it can be performed in the social media space. But I think when we talk about amplification, we want to be very clear about what we mean by amplify. And it's still a little bit unclear to me whether we mean it is actually intensifying these feelings or spreading these feelings to a larger chunk of the population, or if it's just that this polarization becomes more visible to other audiences that had not previously yeah, been good. engaged. That's a good point. Mark, do you want to wrap up for us? All right, so I just want to do uh, thank everybody for coming. It has been a really, uh, uh, to me, it's been an extremely interesting day, and I really want to thank um, uh, Alex and Alex and and Sahar and Tarek and um, Adrian and multiple offender Josh, who's been at several of these workshops in the past, and um, I, we, you know. God only knows the future, but this is probably the final Blogs and Bullets report and five uh, reports over a five-year period, and it's been a really extraordinary uh, research enterprise from my perspective. I think a really unique combination of, uh, of, of political scientists, communication scholar, scholarship, um, the public sector, the tech sector, um, multiple workshops in different locations. It really has been a collective, collaborative enterprise, and one that I think is a really good model for how to bring all these sectors together. Um, and I, I mentioned before, I want to be sure that we go all the way back to the beginning and remember John Sides and Henry Farrell. We actually have uh, two thirds of the um, of the uh, Monkey Cage, uh, Washington Post Monkey Cage team. Uh, uh, at the beginning, at the origins of, um, if we include Josh, uh, of, of Blogs and Bullets. And um, uh, Adrian, we could have brought Laura here, and uh, but you did a fabulous job. Um, and we could have swept the monkey cage editorial committee. <laughs> But, um, but I wanted to be sure just to thank also and just to acknowledge uh, the incredible work. It's been a really great experience working with Sean, and especially with Dean in the back, who didn't get to speak today because he was doing such a ridiculous thing. He was teaching. I mean, who does that, right? <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, it's been an incredible experience working with a uh, research team, and Dean has been an incredible uh, colleague. And uh, with uh, the team out in Stanford, uh, Larry Diamond, and, and the Liberation Tech uh, Center, it's just been an incredible convening opportunity for us to have people from the tech sector. Sector. For everybody at USIP that has sponsored and hosted us here for uh, five years, and it's just been a, a great a venue for doing this sort of thing. Again, the public-private part of it. And then especially uh, Anand Vergesi and Sheldon Himmelfarb, who've been the driving force behind this from the beginning. So thank you for all of your support and help over the years. Thank you all for coming out today. And um, uh, we should have the final report, now that we've incorporated all these helpful comments and suggestions, the final report should be out in a couple weeks. I hope you download it, read it, and tell us what we got wrong. So thank you very much. Thank you.